welcome to the channel. If you're here, you probably came to the same conclusion I did when I first took this exam, is that there's not a whole lot of resources for this exam, the CompTIA Cloud Essentials Plus CLO002 out there on the internet. It is a 75 question exam, multiple choice. It is a 60 minute exam, which means you have less than one minute per question. Just to keep that in mind, it recommends you have six to 12 months of experience as an IT business analyst with cloud exposure or a similar position. The passing score is a 720 on a scale of 100 to 900, which is more than the average CompTIA exam. So we're going to cover everything that is shown on the CompTIA exam objectives briefing. And then we're also going to include some additional things at the end that they they don't explicitly tell you to study, but they do ask you about. These are things that I wish I knew when I took this certification myself, since I do have this and others. However, when I took mine, I had no course or guide or exam prep for this and I passed it. So since you have this guide and me by your side, you will do great. Just as a note, two things to be very aware of is you have less time for this exam than some of the other CompTIA exams, and you also need a slightly higher score to pass than usual. You have under one minute to answer each question, 75 questions, 60 minutes. So it's best to be prepared for that ahead of time and not waste too much time. Flag things if you don't know them and come back to them later, but don't take too long. If you already work in the field, this shouldn't be an issue. The questions don't take as long to read and comprehend as some of the more technical CompTIA exams, since this is more business management focused. If you already have an AWS, GCP, or Azure Cloud certification, this one should be a lot of similar material, just not pertaining to a particular service at those respective companies. So the exam is broken up into four different sections. We have Cloud Concepts, which is 24% of the exam, Business Principles of Cloud Environments, which is 28% of the exam, Management and Technology technical operations, which is 26% of the exam, and then governance, risk, compliance, and security for the cloud, which is 22% of the exam. Section one, cloud concepts. First, we're going to talk about service models. There is PAAS, SAAS, and IAAS, which are the three key models of cloud computing. There are others, but these are the three key models of cloud computing that provide different levels of services and functionalities. Here is an example of each. PAAS, Platform as a Service, is a cloud computing model that provides developers with a platform and tools to build, deploy, and manage applications. With PAAS, developers can focus on coding and application logic while the underlying infrastructure including servers, storage, and networking is managed by the cloud service provider. PAAS platforms typically offer development frameworks, programming languages, libraries, and deployment tools to streamline the application development process. Examples of PAAS include Microsoft Azure App Service, Google App Engine, and Heroku. SAAS, Software as a Service, is a cloud computing model where users access and use software applications over the internet on a subscription basis. In this model, the cloud service provider hosts and manages the entire software application, including infrastructure, middleware, and application software. Users can access the software through a web browser or a thin client without need for installation or maintenance. SAAS is commonly used for applications such as Customer Relationship Management CRM, Enterprise Resource Planning ERP, and productivity tools like email and document collaboration. Popular examples of SAAS include Salesforce, Microsoft 365, and Dropbox. And the last of the three that we're going to be discussing in this section is IAAS, Infrastructure as a Service, which is a cloud computing model that provides virtualized computing resources over the internet. It offers users the fundamental building blocks of computing infrastructure, including virtual machines, storage, and networking. With IAAS, Users have control over the operating systems, applications, and development frameworks they want to run on the provided infrastructure. Users can scale resources up or down based on demand and pay for what they use on a utility-based pricing model. IAAS allows businesses to avoid the cost and complexity of maintaining physical infrastructure. Examples of IAAS include Amazon Web Services EC2, Microsoft Azure Virtual Machines, and Google Cloud Compute Engine. To summarize, Platform as a Service focuses on providing developers with a platform and tools for application development, deployment, and management. Software as a Service delivers fully hosted and managed software applications accessible over the internet on a subscription basis. And Infrastructure as a Service provides virtualized computing infrastructure allowing users to provision and manage virtual machines, storage, and networking. These three cloud computing models offer different levels of abstraction and cater to varying needs and use cases. Organizations can choose the model that best suits their requirements, whether they need a complete development environment like platform as a service, 
ready to use software applications like software as a service or control over the infrastructure, which is infrastructure as a service. Now we're on to deployment models, which include public, private, and hybrid. So all three of these models are different approaches to implementing and managing cloud computing environments. Each model offers unique benefits and considerations based on factors such as security, control, scalability, and cost. Here's an explanation of each deployment model. First up, we have the public cloud. So in a public cloud deployment, the cloud infrastructure is owned and operated by a third-party cloud service provider. The infrastructure is shared among multiple users and organizations. Users access the cloud resources and services over the internet on a pay-as-you-go or subscription basis. Public clouds offer scalability, cost effectiveness, and ease of use. They are well suited for applications with variable or unpredictable workloads, development and testing environments, and non-sensitive data. Examples of public cloud providers include Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Platform. Some of the benefits of the public cloud are that it is cost effective since users pay only for the resources they consume on a subscription or usage-based model, eliminating the need for upfront investments in infrastructure, its scalability, since public clouds offer on-demand scalability, allowing users to quickly scale resources up or down based on demand. Its global availability, since public cloud providers have data centers worldwide, enabling users to deploy applications closer to their target audience. And its managed infrastructure, since the cloud service provider handles the infrastructure maintenance, security, and updates. The two main limitations or drawbacks to the public cloud are number one, it's data security since public clouds are shared environments, which raises concerns about data security and compliance, particularly for sensitive or regulated data. And number two is that they have limited control since users have limited control over the underlying infrastructure and may rely on the service provider for certain configurations and updates. Next up, we have the private cloud. So a private cloud deployment model involves dedicated cloud infrastructure that is exclusively used by a single organization. It can be physically located on premises within the organization's data center or hosted by a third party provider. Private clouds offer enhanced control, security, and customization options. They are suitable for organizations with strict data privacy and compliance requirements, mission critical applications, and specific performance needs. Some of the benefits to a private cloud are its enhanced security and privacy since private clouds provide dedicated resources isolated from other organizations, enabling higher security levels and compliance adherence. Also control and customization since organizations have full control over the infrastructure, allowing customization and configuration to meet specific requirements. In addition to performance, since private clouds offer predictable performance since resources are not shared with other users. The two main drawbacks to the private cloud structure or the traditional server structure is number one, the higher costs since private clouds require investments in hardware, software, and maintenance. The organizations themselves bear the full responsibility for infrastructure management and operational costs. And number two, the limited scalability. See, with public clouds, like for example, AWS, you're able to provision resources very quickly and easily. Private clouds may have limited scalability compared to public clouds as organizations need to provision and manage their own resources. The third and final structure is the hybrid cloud, which seems like it would be the best of both worlds. However, it does still have its drawbacks. A hybrid cloud deployment combines elements of both private and public clouds, creating an integrated environment that allows data and applications to be shared between them. Organizations can leverage the scalability and cost effectiveness of the public cloud while keeping sensitive data and critical workloads in the private cloud. Hybrid clouds offer flexibility, allowing organizations to dynamically allocate resources based on changing needs. There's a few benefits to a hybrid cloud structure. Number one is its flexibility, since organizations can take advantage of the scalability and cost effectiveness of the public cloud while maintaining control over sensitive data in the private cloud. Number two is data placement, since hybrid clouds enable data placement based on security, compliance, and performance requirements. Number three is disaster recovery, which means organizations can use the public cloud for backup and disaster recovery, ensuring data redundancy and business continuity. The hybrid cloud structure does not have very many limitations, but it does have some drawbacks, mostly due to its complexity. Since managing and integrating resources across different cloud environments requires careful planning, 
coordination, and potentially additional management tools. Another consideration should be data transfer and integration, since organizations need to ensure seamless data transfer and integration between public and private clouds. Organizations should consider their specific needs, regulatory requirements, and budget when choosing a cloud deployment model. Some organizations may opt for a single model, while others may adopt a multi-cloud approach combining public, private, and hybrid clouds to meet their diverse needs. Now to the next section, the characteristics of cloud technology. So the first characteristic is elasticity. Elasticity in cloud technology refers to the ability to quickly and dynamically scale computing resources up or down based on the current demand. It allows you to easily adjust the amount of resources such as processing power, storage, and memory allocated to your applications or services, ensuring optimal performance and cost efficiency. Just like a rubber band stretches and contracts, elastic cloud resources can expand or shrink as needed to accommodate fluctuating workloads. Next of the characteristics of cloud technology is self-service. Self-service in cloud technology means that users have direct control and autonomy over their computing resources without needing to go through a lengthy manual process or rely on IT administrators. It empowers users to provision, configure, and manage resources on demand through intuitive web interfaces or APIs. Self-service capabilities allow users to quickly spin up virtual machines, storage, databases, and other services, enabling faster experimentation, development, and deployment of applications. Next is scalability. Scalability refers to the ability of a system or application to handle increasing workloads or accommodate growth without sacrificing performance or stability. In cloud technology, scalability is achieved by leveraging the cloud provider's infrastructure, which can dynamically allocate additional resources to meet the demands of growing or fluctuating workloads. It ensures that your applications can scale seamlessly, whether it's handling a sudden surge in user traffic or accommodating business growth over time. Next characteristic is broad network access. Broad network access means that cloud services can be accessed from anywhere over standard network connections, such as the internet. Users can securely access and utilize cloud resources and applications through a variety of devices, including laptops, desktops, smartphones, and tablets. This accessibility allows for remote work, collaboration, and easy integration with existing on-premises infrastructure. Next characteristic is pay-as-you-go. So this is also known as usage-based pricing or utility billing. It's a payment model in cloud technology where users are charged based on their actual usage of the resources instead of upfront investments or fixed cost, users pay for the specific resources and services they consume, typically on a per hour or per minute basis. This flexible and cost-effective model allows organizations to scale their usage up or down as needed and pay only for what they use, eliminating the need for long-term commitments or over-provisioning. And finally, we have availability, which refers to the ability of cloud services to be consistently accessible and operational. Cloud providers typically offer robust infrastructure and redundant systems that minimize downtime and ensure high availability of services. This includes features like data replication, fault-tolerant architectures, automated backup and recovery processes, and geographically distributed data centers. High availability ensures that your applications and data are accessible to users at all times, promoting continuous business operations and minimizing disruptions. Next topic is the shared responsibility model. So the shared responsibility model is a concept in cloud computing that defines the vision of responsibilities between the cloud service provider and the cloud customer in terms of securing and managing the cloud environment. In simple terms, the shared responsibility model works like this. The cloud service provider, CSP, is responsible for the security of the cloud infrastructure itself. This includes the physical security of the data centers, network infrastructure, and the underlying hardware and software that power the cloud services. The CSP also ensures that the cloud services are available, scalable, and properly maintained. As the cloud customer, you are responsible for the security of your data and applications that you put in the cloud. This includes managing user access, configuring security settings, and implementing security measures within your virtual machines, databases, and applications. You are also responsible for maintaining proper configurations, patching software vulnerabilities, and implementing security best practices specific to your applications and data. In other words, the CSP provides a secure foundation for your cloud services while you have the responsibility to secure and manage your own applications and data within that environment. 
It's a shared effort to ensure the overall security and integrity of the cloud infrastructure. By understanding the shared responsibility model, you can better understand your role in protecting your data and leveraging the security features provided by the cloud service provider. Let's talk now about connectivity types. The first one will be Direct Connect, which is a dedicated network connection provided by cloud service providers. It allows you to establish a direct and private link between your on-premises infrastructure and the cloud provider's data centers. This connection bypasses the public internet, offering higher security, lower latency, and increased bandwidth compared to a regular internet connection. Direct Connect is typically used for scenarios where you need a dedicated and consistent connection to transfer large amounts of data, achieve low latency communication, or ensure enhanced security between your on-premises network and the cloud environment. Next up, we have VPN or Virtual Private Network. A VPN is a secure and encrypted connection that allows users or networks to connect to the cloud environment over the public internet. It creates a virtual tunnel between the user's device or network and the cloud provider's network, encrypting all data transmitted through this tunnel. VPNs provide a secure and private connection, enabling remote users or remote networks to access resources in the cloud as if they are directly connected to the cloud environment. VPNs are commonly used for remote access to cloud services, secure communication between geographically distributed networks, and ensuring privacy and confidentiality of data transmitted over the internet. Direct Connect provides a dedicated and private connection between your on-premises infrastructure and the cloud provider, offering higher security and faster data transfer. VPN, on the other hand, creates a secure and encrypted connection over the public internet, allowing remote users or networks to access cloud resources securely. Both Direct Connect and VPN serve different purposes and can be used based on your specific networking requirements in the cloud. Now we have common access types. First off, we have RDP or Remote Desktop Protocol. RDP is a technology that allows users to remotely access and control a computer or server from another device. It enables you to connect to a remote computer over a network and interact with its desktop interface as if you are physically sitting in front of it. RDP is commonly used for remote administration, technical support, or accessing resources on a remote machine. SSH or Secure Shell is a secure network protocol that allows secure remote access to and management of network devices or servers. It provides a secure way to log into a remote system and execute commands securely over an unsecured network such as the internet. SSH ensures secure authentication and encrypted communication protecting the confidentiality and integrity of data transmitted between the client and the server. And the last one we're going to cover here is HTTPS, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, Secure. This is the secure version of the HTTP protocol used for transmitting data over the internet. It adds an extra layer of security by encrypting the data exchanged between a user's web browser and a website server. HTTPS is commonly used for secure online transactions such as e-commerce, online banking, and any other situation where sensitive data needs to be protected from unauthorized access. RDP allows you to control another computer remotely as if you were sitting in front of it. SSH provides a secure and encrypted way to access and manage remote computers or servers. HTTPS ensures secure communication between your web browser and a website, protecting your sensitive information during online transactions. These access types serve different purposes, but share the common goal of providing secure and controlled access to remote resources and information. Next topic, software-defined networking. SDN, or software-defined networking, is an approach to networking that separates the network control plane from the underlying physical infrastructure. It allows network administrators to manage and control the entire network network infrastructure through software-based controllers, providing flexibility, scalability, and centralized management. SDN simplifies network configuration, improves network agility, and enables the implementation of network policies and services in a more efficient and dynamic manner. So the next subject is load balancing. Load balancing is a technique used in computer networks and server infrastructure to distribute incoming network traffic across multiple servers or resources. The goal of load balancing is to optimize resource utilization, improve performance, and ensure high availability. Let's explore how load balancing works in more depth. First and foremost, traffic distribution. Load balancing distributes incoming network traffic across multiple servers or resources to avoid overloading any single server. It acts as a centralized point that receives incoming requests and determines how to distribute them among the available resources. Another not so obvious benefit to load balancing is health monitoring. 
Load balancers continuously monitor the health and availability of the servers or resources they manage. They periodically check the responsiveness and status of each server through various health checks, such as pinging the server or checking specific ports or services. This allows the load balancer to determine which servers are capable of handling traffic at any given time. Now I want to talk about some load balancing algorithms. See, load balancers use different algorithms to determine how to distribute incoming traffic among the available resources. Some common load balancing algorithms include round robin, where traffic is distributed equally in a circular manner with each server receiving an equal share of requests. Least connection, where traffic is directed towards the server with the fewest active connections, distributing the load based on current server utilization. Weighted round robin, where each server is assigned a weight and traffic is distributed proportionately based on the assigned weight and IP hash, where traffic is distributed based on the source or destination IP address, ensuring that requests from the same client are always directed to the same server. Some applications require that subsequent requests from a client are directed to the same server to maintain session state. Load balancers can implement session persistence or sticky sessions where a client's requests are consistently directed to the same server for the duration of their session. This is typically achieved by using cookies or source IP based affinity. Load balancing enables horizontal scalability by allowing new servers or resources to be added to the pool dynamically. If the load increases, additional servers can be added to distribute the load and handle increased traffic. Load balancers also provide redundancy by ensuring that if a server fails or becomes unavailable, traffic is automatically redirected to other available servers. Load balancers often provide monitoring and analytics capabilities, allowing administrators to track and analyze network traffic, server performance, and other metrics. This information helps in capacity planning, identifying performance bottlenecks, and making making informed decisions for optimizing the load balancing configuration. By effectively distributing traffic and optimizing resource utilization, load balancing enhances performance, improves response times, and ensures high availability of applications and services. It helps to evenly distribute the workload across servers, prevent overloading, and provide a seamless user experience even under high traffic conditions. Next item we have is DNS or Domain Name Server. In the digital world, every computer or device connected to the internet has a unique address called an IP address. It's like a phone number for computers. However, IP addresses are a series of numbers that are a little difficult for us humans to remember or use easily, especially if they're IPv6. That's where DNS comes in. DNS is like a phone book for the internet. Instead of remembering and using IP addresses, we can use human-friendly names called domain names like youtube.com or myfreeacademy.org. DNS translates these domain names into the corresponding IP addresses that computers can understand. Here's how DNS works. When you type a domain name into your browser like youtube.com, your computer sends a request to a DNS server asking for the IP address associated with that domain name. The DNS server looks in its phone book, which is a large database, and finds the IP address associated with the requested domain name. The DNS server then sends the IP address back to your computer. Your computer can now use that IP address to establish a connection with the correct server and retrieve the web page or content associated with that domain name. So instead of having to remember and type complex numbers, we can use domain names to easily access websites, send emails, or connect to other computers on the internet. DNS acts as the translator that helps us find the right IP address associated with that domain name, just like a phone book helps us find the right phone number for a friend. In summary, DNS is like a digital phone book that translates human-friendly domain names into computer-friendly IP addresses, allowing us to navigate and connect to different websites and services on the internet more easily. Next item is a firewall. So a firewall is a network security device that monitors and controls incoming and outgoing network traffic based on predefined security rules. It acts as a barrier between an internal network, such as a corporate network, and external networks, such as the internet, filtering and blocking unauthorized or malicious traffic while allowing legitimate traffic to pass through. Firewalls protect against network threats such as unauthorized access, malware, and denial of service attacks by enforcing security policies and controlling 
network communication. Now we have some cloud service storage features. Number one is compression. Compression is a technique used to reduce the size of files or data by removing redundancies and encoding them in a more efficient manner. It helps to save storage space and improve data transfer speeds. When data is compressed, it takes up less storage space and can be transmitted or processed more quickly. Next, we have deduplication, which is a process that identifies and eliminates duplicate copies of data within a storage system. It helps to optimize storage space by storing only one instance of each unique piece of data and replacing subsequent duplicates with references to the original copy. Deduplication reduces storage costs and improves data efficiency by eliminating redundant data. The third and final of the storage features on the objectives is Capacity on Demand, which is a model where resources such as computing power or storage can be dynamically provisioned and scaled based on demand. It allows organizations to increase or decrease their resource allocation as needed, ensuring that they have the necessary capacity to handle varying workloads. Capacity on Demand provides flexibility and cost efficiency. Next subject is storage characteristics, hot storage versus cold storage. So hot storage refers to storage systems or tiers that are optimized for fast and frequent access to data. It is typically used for data that requires low latency and high performance. Hot storage is designed to deliver quick response times, making it suitable for frequently accessed or critical data that needs to be readily available. Cold storage, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. This refers to storage systems or tiers that are optimized for long-term data retention and archival. It is used for storing data that is accessed infrequently or has lower priority in terms of performance requirements. Cold storage is cost-effective and provides higher storage capacities, but may have longer retrieval times compared to hot storage. The main performance differences between hot storage and cold storage lies in the speed of access and the response time for retrieving data. Hot storage being optimized for fast and frequent access provides quick response times and low latency. It's suitable for applications or workloads that require immediate access to data such as online databases, active workloads, or frequently accessed files. The data stored in hot storage is readily available and can be accessed almost instantly. On the other hand, cold storage sacrifices some performance for cost effectiveness and long-term retention. While it still allows access to data, the response times may be slower compared to hot storage. Cold storage is suitable for data that is infrequently accessed such as backup archives, historical records, or data that needs to be stored for regulatory compliance. It's important to note that the choice between hot storage and cold storage depends on the specific needs of the data and the requirements of the applications or workloads using that data. Balancing performance requirements and cost considerations is crucial in determining the appropriate storage solution for different types of data. Hot storage provides fast and frequent access to data with low latency and high performance characteristics. Cold storage offers cost-effective, long-term data retention, sacrificing some performance for lower cost and higher capacity. Next subject is storage types. There are three storage types, the first of which is object storage. Object storage is a method of storing and managing data in the form of objects. Each object consists of the data itself, a unique identifier or object ID, and associated metadata. Object storage systems typically provide a flat address space where objects are organized and accessed based on their unique identifiers. Object storage is highly scalable and suitable for storing large amounts of unstructured data, such as files, images, videos, or backups. It offers high durability as objects are replicated across multiple storage nodes, ensuring data availability even in the event of hardware failures. Object storage is accessed using APIs, making it a popular choice for cloud-based storage services. Next up, we have file storage, which involves organizing and managing data in a hierarchical structure of directories and files. It resembles how files are organized on a local computer or network file system. In file storage, multiple users or applications Applications can access and modify files concurrently, supporting features like file locking and permissions. File storage is commonly used for shared access to files in a collaborative environment. It allows users to organize data in a familiar directory structure and provides the ability to read, write, and delete files. Cloud-based file storage services offer scalable and managed file systems in the cloud, enabling users to store and access files across multiple instances or virtual machines. 
And last but not least, we have block storage, which involves breaking data into fixed size blocks and storing them as individual units. Each block is assigned a unique address and can be accessed independently. Block storage provides direct block level access to data, making it suitable for applications that require low level storage access, such as databases or virtual machines. Block storage is often used for storing and managing data in raw format without any inherent file system structure. It provides high performance and low latency access to data and allows for advanced features like snapshots and cloning. Cloud-based block storage services offer flexible and scalable storage volumes that can be attached to virtual machines or used in storage area networks. The TLDR is object storage is ideal for storing unstructured data at scale, file storage provides shared access to files in hierarchical structure, and block storage offers low-level access for applications that require direct control over storage. Cloud service providers offer these storage options to accommodate various data storage and management requirements. On to the next subject, software-defined storage. Software-defined storage is an approach to storage management that separates the control plane, the management and orchestration of storage resources, from the data plane, the actual storage hardware. It is a software-centric approach that provides greater flexibility, scalability, and automation in managing storage infrastructure. In traditional storage systems, the storage hardware and the storage management functions are tightly integrated. With software-defined storage, the management and control of storage resources are abstracted and decoupled from the underlying hardware. This allows organizations to use commodity hardware and manage storage resources more efficiently and dynamically through software. Here are some key aspects and benefits of software-defined storage. Number one is abstraction. Software-defined storage abstracts the underlying storage hardware, presenting a virtualized view of these storage resources to the applications or systems that need storage. It allows for the pooling of storage resources from diverse hardware vendors into a unified storage pool, simplifying management and providing greater flexibility. Number two is automation and orchestration. SDS enables automation and orchestration of storage tasks through software. Storage policies and configurations can be defined and managed centrally, making it easier to provision, allocate, and manage storage resources dynamically. This improves operational efficiency and reduces manual tasks. Number three, scalability and flexibility. SDS provides scalability by allowing organizations to scale storage capacity and performance independently of the underlying hardware. New storage resources can be easily added to the storage pool, and existing resources can be dynamically allocated or reallocated based on changing needs. This helps organizations adapt to growing storage demands more efficiently. Number four, cost efficiency. By leveraging commodity hardware and abstracting the storage management functions, SDS can provide cost savings compared to traditional storage systems. It allows organizations to use standard, off-the-shelf hardware components, reducing dependency on proprietary storage solutions and potentially lowering costs. Number five, data services and features. Software-defined storage often includes advanced data services and features that enhance data protection, availability, and efficiency. These can include features like data deduplication, data replication, snapshots, data tiering, data encryption, among others. Number six, vendor neutrality. SDS promotes vendor neutrality, allowing organizations to choose and mix storage hardware from different vendors based on their specific requirements. It avoids vendor lock-in and provides the freedom to select the most suitable hardware components for different tiers of storage. Overall, software-defined storage offers greater agility, scalability, and cost efficiency in managing and provisioning storage resources. By separating storage management from the hardware, organizations can achieve more flexible, automated, and scalable storage environments that meet their evolving business needs. Next subject is the content delivery network. And this is one of those things where the front runners like Google, Microsoft, and especially Amazon have a massive leg up over the competition. A content delivery network is a distributed network of servers located in different geographical locations. It is designed to deliver web content such as images, videos, and other static or dynamic files to end users with improved speed and performance. CDNs reduce the latency of content delivery by caching content in servers closer to the end users, minimizing the distance data needs to travel. This results in faster page loading times and a better user experience, especially for globally distributed audiences accessing web content from different locations. Let's walk through a brief explanation of how a CDN actually works. The website owner uploads their content to the CDN. This can include things like images, 
videos, or the website's pages and files. When a person visits the website, the CDN determines their location and sends the content from the server that is closest to them. This reduces the distance the content has to travel, making it load faster. The CDN server caches or stores a copy of the content so that if another person in the same area visits the website, the content can be delivered quickly from the nearby server instead of the original website server. By using a CDN, websites can provide a better user experience by delivering content quickly, reducing the time it takes for web pages to load, and improving overall performance. CDNs are particularly useful when websites have visitors from different parts of the world because they help reduce latency and ensure a smoother browsing experience. So in summary, a content delivery network is a network of servers located around the world that help deliver digital content like web pages, images, or videos quickly to people by storing copies of the content in servers closer to them. This makes websites load faster and provides a better user experience. Next bullet points are some definitions. So first off, we have redundancy, which in cloud technology means having multiple copies or backups of data, systems, or resources to ensure that if one fails, there are others available to take over and prevent downtime. High availability, which in cloud technology means designing systems and infrastructure in a way that ensures they are always accessible and operational, minimizing the chances of service interruptions or disruptions. Disaster recovery, which in cloud technology refers to having plans and procedures in place to quickly recover and restore data, systems, and services in the event of a major failure, outage, or disaster, ensuring business continuity and minimizing the impact on users or customers. Next subject is recovery objectives. So RPO, or recovery point objective, and RTO, recovery time objective, are two important metrics used in cloud technology to measure the ability to recover data and systems after a disruption or disaster. RPO, or recovery point objective, refers to the maximum acceptable amount of data loss that a company can tolerate. It signifies a point in time to which data needs to be recovered. For example, if the RPO is one hour, it means that after a failure, the recovered data should be no older than one hour before the incident occurred. RTO, on the other hand, or recovery time objective, refers to the maximum acceptable downtime or duration it takes to recover a system or service after a disruption. It represents the time it takes to restore that system and make it operational again. For instance, if the RTO is four hours, it means that the system should be up and running within four hours after a failure. Both RPO and RTO play a crucial role in determining the data backup frequency, disaster recovery strategies, and overall resilience of cloud-based systems, ensuring that organizations can recover their data and resume their operations in a timely and efficient manner. Here's a little tip for you for the exam is to know the abbreviations because there are some questions where they're forced to use the abbreviations instead of writing out the actual names because if they gave you the full name, you would know the answer to the question. If the question asks you something about time and the abbreviation in one of the answers is RTO, that is more likely than not the correct answer. Section one is complete. Now we're on to section two, business principles of cloud environments. First up, we have current and future requirements. Current requirements refer to the needs and expectations that exist in the present time. These requirements are based on the existing circumstances, technologies, and user demands. They outline what is necessary for a particular system, product, or service to function effectively and meet the current expectations of its users. Future requirements, on the other hand, are the anticipated needs and expectations that are likely to arise in the future. They take into account emerging technologies, evolving user preferences, market trends, and potential challenges that may impact the system or product. Future requirements help organizations plan ahead and ensure that their systems or products remain relevant, competitive, and adaptable to the changing landscape. In simple terms, current requirements focus on the present needs, while future requirements anticipate and prepare for the upcoming needs and challenges. Both are important for organizations to deliver value and stay ahead in a dynamic and evolving environment. Next bullet point is baseline. So in cloud technology, a baseline refers to a starting point or a reference point against which future measurements or progress can be compared. It establishes a standard or benchmark to assess changes, improvements, or deviations from the established norm. Coming up next, we have a feasibility study, which is an assessment conducted to determine the practicality and viability of a proposed project or initiative. In cloud technology, a feasibility study helps evaluate factors such as technical capabilities, cost, 
resources, and potential benefits to determine whether implementing a cloud solution is realistic and beneficial for the organization. Next item is a gap analysis, which in the context of business, a gap analysis is the evaluation of the current state of an organization's processes, practices, or performance compared to the desired or optimal state. It identifies the gaps or discrepancies between the current and desired state, helping organizations understand what needs to be improved, developed, or changed to bridge the gap and achieve their goals. Technical gap analysis refers to assessing the existing IT infrastructure, systems, and capabilities in comparison to the requirements or standards. It identifies gaps between the current technical environment and the desired state, enabling organizations to identify areas where enhancements, upgrades, or changes are needed to align with cloud technology best practices and meet business objectives. Next subject is reporting, which gets broken up into three different subsections. Number one is compute reporting, which involves tracking and analyzing data related to the computational resources in the cloud, such as virtual machines, containers, or serverless functions. It includes metrics like CPU utilization, memory usage, response times, and application performance. Compute reporting helps monitor resource utilization, identify bottlenecks, optimize resource allocation, and ensure efficient usage of compute resources. Second one is network reporting, which focuses on monitoring and analyzing network-related data in the cloud environment. It includes metrics like network bandwidth, latency, packet loss, and network traffic patterns. Network reporting helps identify network congestion, optimize network configurations, troubleshoot connectivity issues, and ensure smooth data transfer and communication within the cloud infrastructure. And the third and final one, storage reporting, involves tracking and analyzing data related to the storage resources in the cloud, such as object storage, block storage, or file systems. It includes metrics like storage capacity, IOPS, input-output operations per second, latency, and data transfer rates. Storage reporting helps monitor storage usage, identify performance issues, optimize storage configurations, and ensure data availability and reliability. Next item is benchmarks, which in cloud technology refer to standards or performance indicators that are used to measure and compare the performance, efficiency, or effectiveness of cloud-based systems, services, or providers. They serve as reference points for evaluating the performance, scalability, reliability, and cost-effectiveness of cloud solutions, helping organizations make informed decisions and optimize their cloud deployments. Next item is documentation and diagrams. Very exciting, I know. In cloud technology, documentation refers to written materials that provide information, guidelines, instructions, and procedures related to the deployment, configuration, management, and use of cloud-based systems, services, or infrastructure. Documentation helps us understand how to effectively utilize the cloud technology and serves as a reference for troubleshooting, best practices, and overall system maintenance and it's also very, very exciting. Diagrams in cloud technology are visual representations that depict the architecture, components, connections, and interactions of a cloud-based system or infrastructure. They help illustrate the design, layout, and relationships between different elements in a clear and organized manner, making it easier for stakeholders to understand and communicate complex technical concepts or workflows. Next item, key stakeholders. These are individuals, groups, or entities that have a vested interest or influence in the cloud-based system or project. They can include business owners, IT managers, developers, operations teams, and end users. Key stakeholders are involved in decision-making, requirement gathering, project planning, and ensuring that the cloud technology aligns with the needs and objectives of the organization. Next item is the point of contact, which in cloud technology refers to a designated person or team responsible for communication, coordination, and handling inquiries or issues related to the cloud-based system or service. They act as a central point for users, stakeholders, or external parties to reach out to for support, guidance, or reporting of any concerns or questions. So a lot of these items are important for business as a whole, not just cloud services. These next two items, CapEx and OpEx, are two good examples of that. So CapEx is capital expenditures, which in cloud technology refer to the upfront investments made by an organization for acquiring physical hardware, software licenses, or infrastructure to establish or expand their cloud environment. These investments are typically long-term and are associated with the initial setup costs of the cloud infrastructure. 
OPEX or operating expenditures refers to the ongoing expenses incurred in the day-to-day -day operations and maintenance of cloud-based systems or services. This can include costs for cloud service subscriptions, data transfer, storage usage, network connectivity, support, and other operational expenses. Unlike capital expenditures, operating expenditures are recurring and directly tied to the usage and consumption of cloud resources. Starting to feel like this is Business School 101, so next we have variable versus fixed cost. Variable costs in cloud technology are expenses that fluctuate based on your actual usage of cloud resources. These costs depend on factors such as the amount of computing power you consume, the storage space you use, the data transfer volume, and the duration of your usage. Think of it like paying for electricity based on how much you actually use. When you use more resources or services, your variable costs increase. Conversely, if you use fewer resources, your variable costs decrease, variable costs in the cloud are often billed on a pay-as-you-go basis, meaning you only pay for what you use. Fixed costs in cloud technology, on the other hand, are expenses that remain consistent regardless of your usage. These costs are typically associated with maintaining a baseline level of cloud infrastructure or services. For example, if you have a fixed number of virtual machines running 24-7, you'd pay a fixed cost for those instances, even if you don't fully utilize their capacity. Fixed costs are more predictable and provide a level of stability in budgeting as they do not change based on usage. To simplify, variable costs in cloud technology are like paying for what you use, while fixed costs are like having a consistent fee for having certain resources or services available, regardless of your actual usage. Next subject is licensing model. So first we have bring your own license BYOL. This is a licensing model in cloud technology where you can use your existing software licenses to deploy and run applications or services on cloud infrastructure. Instead of purchasing new licenses from the cloud provider, you will bring your own licenses, allowing allowing you to utilize your existing investments and maintain license compliance. On the flip side, we have the subscription model, which involves paying a recurring fee to access and use specific software or services provided by the cloud vendor. This model typically grants you access to the latest versions, updates, and support for the subscribed software or services for the duration of the subscription period. Now we're on to contracts. In cloud technology, contracts are legal agreements between the cloud provider and the customer that outline the terms and conditions of using the cloud services. Contracts cover aspects such as service level agreements, SLAs, data privacy and security, usage policies, responsibilities of both parties, and any additional terms specific to the cloud services being offered. Contracts ensure clarity, protection, and define the obligations and rights of all parties involved. Next item they want you to know is billing. Billing in cloud and technology refers to the process of invoicing and charging for the usage of cloud services. The cloud provider calculates the cost based on various factors such as the amount of compute resources consumed, storage usage, data transfer, and additional services used. Billing may occur on a regular basis such as monthly or hourly and the customer receives a detailed invoice reflecting the usage and associated costs. RFI, or Request for Information, is a formal document or process used in cloud technology to gather information from potential cloud providers. It's usually a part of the vendor selection or procurement process where organizations request details on various aspects such as the provider's capabilities, infrastructure, security measures, pricing models, support, and any other relevant information. RFIs help organizations assess the suitability and compatibility of cloud providers with their specific requirements before making a decision. Human capital in cloud technology refers to the knowledge, skills, expertise, and competencies of individuals working with or managing cloud-based systems and services. Training in cloud technology involves providing individuals with the necessary knowledge and skills to effectively understand utilize and manage cloud resources and technologies. It can include educational programs, workshops, online courses, or hands-on sessions that cover topics such as cloud computing concepts, cloud infrastructure management, security best practices, and specific cloud platforms or tools. Training helps individuals acquire the technical know-how and confidence to work with cloud technologies efficiently. Professional development in cloud technology focuses on continuous learning, growth, and improvement of individual skills and capabilities in the cloud domain. It involves activities like attending conferences, webinars, 
industry events, pursuing certifications, participating in communities or forums, and keeping up with the latest trends and advancements in cloud technology. Professional development ensures that the individuals stay updated with the evolving cloud landscape, enhance their expertise, and adapt to new challenges and opportunities in the field. Human capital in cloud technology involves providing individuals with the necessary training and opportunities for professional development to equip them with the knowledge and skills required to effectively work with and leverage cloud-based systems and services. It helps individuals stay competent, up-to-date, and capable of maximizing the benefits of cloud technology in their roles. Professional services. This refers to specialized services provided by experts or consultants to assist organizations with various aspects of cloud adoption and implementation. These services can include cloud strategy development, architecture design, migration planning, deployment assistance, optimization, and other consulting services tailored to specific business needs. Professional services help organizations leverage the expertise of professionals to ensure successful cloud adoption and maximize the benefits of cloud technology. Next item is time to market, which refers to the speed or efficiency with which a product or service can be developed, tested, and brought to market using cloud resources and capabilities. Cloud technology offers scalability, on-demand resources, and rapid deployment options that can significantly reduce the time it takes to develop and launch new applications or services. By leveraging the cloud, organizations can accelerate their development processes, iterate quickly, and respond to market demands faster. Skill availability refers to the availability of individuals or professionals with the required knowledge and expertise to work effectively with cloud-based systems and services. Cloud technology introduces new tools, platforms, and practices that may require specific skills such as cloud architecture, security, DevOps, and data management. Ensuring skill availability involves attracting, developing, and retaining talent with the necessary cloud skills or leveraging external resources such as professional services to fill any skill gaps. Support refers to the assistance and guidance provided by cloud service providers to their customers. It includes technical support, troubleshooting, issue resolution, and customer service related to the use and management of cloud services. Support can be offered through various channels like online documentation, knowledge bases, community forums, and direct communication with support teams. Reliable and responsive support is essential for organizations to address any challenges or concerns they may encounter while utilizing cloud services. Managed services in cloud technology involve outsourcing certain IT operations or responsibilities to a third-party service provider. These services can include cloud infrastructure management, monitoring, security, backup and recovery, performance optimization, and other operational tasks. By utilizing managed services, organizations can offload the burden of day-to-day -day management and maintenance of cloud resources, allowing them to focus on the core business activities while relying on experts to ensure the smooth operation of their cloud environment. We are going to cover this a little bit more at the end because there are going to be a number of questions on managed service providers versus cloud service providers, and I want to make sure that you guys know enough information on this specific topic. A statement of work is a formal document that defines the scope, objectives, deliverables, timelines, and responsibilities of a specific project or engagement. It outlines the specific tasks, activities, and requirements that need to be fulfilled by the cloud provider or vendor. The statement of work helps establish clear expectations, mitigate misunderstandings, and serve as a reference for both parties throughout the project. A service level agreement, or SLA, is a contract between a cloud service provider and a customer that outlines the agreed upon level of service and performance standards. It defines metrics such as availability, uptime, response times, and support expectations. The SLA establishes the responsibilities and commitments of the cloud provider and sets the basis for monitoring, measuring, and ensuring the quality of service provided. The CompTIA exam objectives have some silly things, like for example we need to know what training is, which is educational activities aimed at equipping individuals with the knowledge, skills, and competencies required to effectively work with cloud-based systems and services. Cloud training can include various formats such as online courses, workshops, hands-on labs, or instructor-led sessions. Training helps individuals understand the concepts, tools, and best practices associated with cloud technology, enabling them to perform their roles more efficiently and confidently. The next topic is evaluations, which is split up into four subtopics. The first one is a pilot evaluation, which in cloud technology involves a small scale controlled implementation of a cloud solution or service to assess its feasibility, performance, and suitability. 
It helps organizations test the functionality, evaluate potential challenges, gather user feedback, and make informed decisions before a full-scale deployment. The second evaluation is a proof of value, so this demonstrates the practical benefits and value of a cloud solution or service to stakeholders. It involves implementing a specific use case or scenario to showcase the capabilities, cost-effectiveness, or competitive advantages of the solution. The proof of value helps organizations validate their decision to adopt the cloud technology. Next evaluation is the proof of concept, which tests the technical feasibility and viability of a new cloud technology or idea. It involves building a small scale prototype or conducting experiments to demonstrate how the solution can address a specific problem or meet specific requirements. The proof of concept helps organizations assess the potential of the technology before committing to full-scale deployment or implementation. The fourth and final evaluation is the success criteria. So this refers to the specific goals, outcomes, or benchmarks that determine the success or achievement of a cloud project, initiative, or deployment. These criteria can include factors such as improved performance, cost savings, enhanced security, increased efficiency, or user satisfaction. Establishing clear success criteria helps set expectations, measure progress, and evaluate the overall effectiveness and impact of the cloud technology implementation. Next item is open source versus proprietary. So these are two different software models in cloud technology. Open source software is publicly available and can be freely used, modified, and distributed by anyone. It is developed and maintained by a community of contributors. Proprietary software, on the other hand, is privately owned and controlled by a specific company or vendor. Think. Open Office versus Microsoft Office, think Linux versus Windows. Proprietary software is licensed to users with certain restrictions and limitations. The main difference is that open source software offers transparency, community collaboration, and flexibility, while proprietary software provides control, support, and proprietary features from the vendor. Next subject, identity access management, and then we have three subsections over there. So identity access management in cloud technology refers to the practices and technologies used to manage and control user access to cloud-based resources and services. It involves ensuring that the right individuals have the appropriate level of access privileges based on their roles and responsibilities. IAM includes various security mechanisms and protocols to authenticate and authorize users, enforce access policies, and protect sensitive data. Under this section is Single Sign-On, which is an IAM mechanism that enables users to authenticate once and gain access to multiple applications or systems without having to re-enter credentials for each one. With SSO, users only need to log in once and their authentication is recognized across different applications, simplifying the login process and improving user experience. Next under IAM is Multi-Factor Authentication, MFA, which is a security technique used in IAM to add an extra layer of protection to user logins. It requires users to provide multiple pieces of evidence to verify their identity, typically combining something they know, like a password, something they have, like a physical token or smartphone, or something they are, like biometric data, like fingerprints or facial recognition. MFA enhances security by making it more difficult for unauthorized individuals to gain access even if they have obtained a user's password. And the last one under IM is federation. So this refers to the process of establishing trust and enabling users from one identity domain, such as an organization, to access resources in another domain without requiring separate authentication. It allows users to access multiple systems or services seamlessly using their existing credentials. Federation is commonly used in scenarios where organizations need to collaborate or integrate their systems securely while maintaining control over their own identity management. Next up, we have cloud native applications. So these are software applications specifically designed and built to run in cloud environments, taking advantage of cloud native features and capabilities. These applications are typically developed using modern cloud technologies and architectural principles to be highly scalable, resilient, and easily adaptable to cloud infrastructure. They often leverage microservices and containerization to enable rapid development, deployment, and scalability. Microservices is an architectural approach in cloud native applications where applications are broken down into smaller, loosely coupled services. Each service represents a specific functionality or business capability and can be developed, deployed, and scaled independently. Microservices enable agility, flexibility, and easier maintenance of applications in cloud environments. So we can't talk about something like microservices without also talking about containerization. So containerization is a technology that allows applications and their dependencies to be packaged together as 
containers. Containers provide a lightweight and isolated environment where applications can run consistently across different computing environments. They simplify the development and management of applications in cloud environments, enabling scalability, portability, and efficient resource utilization. Next is data analytics. So this is the process of examining and interpreting large volumes of data to uncover meaningful insights, patterns, and trends. This involves using various techniques, tools, and algorithms to analyze data and make data-driven decisions. Data analytics in the cloud leverages the scalability, computing power, and storage capabilities of the cloud to process and analyze vast amounts of data very efficiently. Next, we have machine learning. This is all over social media because it's a very trendy topic to talk about. Uh, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence that focuses on training computer systems to learn and improve from data without being explicitly programmed. In cloud technology, machine learning algorithms and models can be deployed and executed on cloud infrastructure, enabling the processing and analysis of large data sets to identify patterns, make predictions, or automate tasks. Cloud platforms provide the computational resources and scalability required for training and deploying machine learning models. Next up, we have artificial intelligence, which I'm sure you're already familiar with, but we're just going to go over it again. So artificial intelligence refers to the development of computer systems or machines that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence. AI encompasses various techniques such as machine learning, natural language processing or NLP, computer vision, and reasoning. In cloud technology, AI algorithms and models can be deployed and run on cloud infrastructure, allowing organizations to leverage AI capabilities without the need for extensive computational resources or expertise. Next, we have big data, which refers to extremely large and complex data sets that cannot be effectively processed or analyzed using traditional data processing methods. Big data is characterized by its volume, velocity, and variety. These three V's are going to be very important for you to remember just in the field. Volume, velocity, and variety. Cloud technology provides scalable and distributed computing resources that can handle big data processing and storage requirements. By leveraging the cloud, organizations can store, process, and analyze massive amounts of data efficiently, extracting valuable insights and driving data-driven decision-making. Next subject is digital marketing, which refers to the promotion of products, services, or brands using digital channels and technologies. It involves various online marketing strategies and tactics to reach and engage with target audiences, drive website traffic, generate leads, and ultimately convert customers. In cloud technology, digital marketing can benefit from cloud-based platforms and tools that enable efficient campaign management, data analytics, and automation. Under digital marketing, we do have email campaigns and social media. I'm sure you're familiar with both of those already, but we're going to go over them again just in case. Email campaigns in digital marketing involve sending targeted messages or promotional content to a group of individuals via email. It is a way to reach and communicate with potential customers, build brand awareness, spam people, I mean, nurture relationships and drive desired actions. In cloud technology, email marketing platforms hosted in the cloud provide features like email automation, personalization, tracking, and analytics, making it easier for businesses to manage and optimize their email campaigns. Next, we have social media, which I'm sure none of you are familiar with at all. So this refers to the use of social networking platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and others to promote products, engage with audiences, and build brand presence. It involves creating and sharing content, running targeted advertising campaigns, interacting with followers, and monitoring social media analytics. Cloud technology provides social media management tools and analytics platforms that help businesses streamline their social media activities, schedule posts, track engagement, and measure the effectiveness of their social media efforts. Next item is autonomous environments. So autonomous environments refers to systems or infrastructures that can operate and manage themselves with minimal human intervention. These environments leverage automation, artificial intelligence, and machine learning to optimize performance, ensure scalability, and self-heal in response to failures or changing demands. Autonomous environments in the cloud enable organizations to streamline operations, reduce manual efforts, and improve efficiency. Next item is the Internet of Things, or IoT. So the Internet of Things refers to the network of physical devices, sensors, and objects that are connected to the Internet and collect and exchange data. These devices can range from everyday objects like thermostats and wearables to industrial machinery, 
and vehicles. The easiest way to think about the Internet of Things is like a smart home. Cloud technology provides the infrastructure and platforms to process and analyze the vast amounts of data generated by IoT devices, enabling organizations to gain insights, automate processes, and create new applications and services. Next item we have is blockchain. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but maybe not the specifics of what exactly it is. Blockchain and cloud technology is a distributed and decentralized digital ledger that records transactions across multiple different computers or nodes. It provides a secure and transparent way to verify and store digital information, such as transactions, contracts, or records. Cloud technology can host blockchain networks, providing the computing power, storage, and security required for blockchain operations. It enables organizations to leverage blockchain technology for various use cases, such as supply chain management, financial transactions, or identity verification. Next up, we have subscription services, which we already kind of touched on. So this is the model where users pay a recurring fee to access and use cloud-based applications, platforms, or services. Instead of purchasing software infrastructure outright, users subscribe to these services and gain access to the functionality they need over the internet. Subscription services in the cloud offer flexibility, scalability, and cost effectiveness as users can scale their usage up or down based on their needs without heavy upfront investments. Next up, we have collaboration. So think Dropbox or GitHub if you ever used uh, those technologies. So collaboration uses cloud-based tools and platforms to facilitate teamwork, communication, and shared workspaces. These tools allow individuals or teams to collaborate on documents, share files, communicate in real time, and coordinate tasks from different locations. Cloud-based collaboration tools enable efficient and seamless collaboration, enabling teams to work together effectively and improve productivity. Next up, we have VDI or virtual desktop infrastructure. So this refers to the virtualization of desktop environments where the user's desktop is hosted and executed on a cloud server rather than a physical computer. With VDI, users can access their virtual desktops remotely from any device with an internet connection. Cloud-based VDI offers flexibility, centralized management, and enhanced security as the desktop environment is hosted and maintained in the cloud. Next, we have self-service, which we have already discussed previously, but we may as well go over it again. So self-service in cloud technology just means that users can independently access and manage cloud resources and services without relying on IT or support teams. An example is having a user-friendly interface or portal where individuals can select and provision the cloud resources they need, such as virtual machines or storage, on their own. Self-service in the cloud empowers users to have more control and agility in managing their resources, reducing the need for manual intervention and enabling faster deployment. Next up, we have a few migration strategies. So the first one is rip and replace. So this refers to the process of removing or ripping existing technology or systems and replacing them with new cloud-based solutions. It involves discounting the use of legacy systems or infrastructure and migrating to cloud based alternatives. Rip and Replace can offer organizations the benefits of cloud technologies such as scalability, cost savings, improved performance, but it requires careful planning and execution to ensure a smooth transition. In comparison, we also have Lift and Shift, which is another migration strategy of moving existing applications or workloads from on-premises infrastructure to the cloud without making significant changes to the architecture or code. It's like lifting your application from its current environment and shifting it to a virtual server server in the cloud. The goal is to replicate the existing setup as closely as possible, including the operating system, applications, and configurations. Lift and Shift allows organizations to quickly migrate their applications to the cloud while minimizing the need for extensive modifications. So there should be a few questions on rip and replace or lift and shift, and there should be some options in some of the different questions. The best way to think about this is rip and replace is really more for legacy systems that you're going to need to update anyway. Lift and shift is for things that are newer and just need to be shifted over to the cloud. This one is not necessarily a migration strategy. It's more of a deployment model. We have hybrid next, which combines both on-premises infrastructure and cloud services. We did touch on this before though. Uh, it involves integrating and connecting on-premises resources with public or private cloud environments to create a unified infrastructure. In hybrid cloud setup, organizations can leverage the flexibility and scalability of the cloud for certain workloads or applications while keeping sensitive or critical data on premises. Hybrid cloud allows businesses to maintain control over their data and infrastructure while benefiting from the agility and cost efficiency 
of the cloud. So now onto the last migration strategy that is in the exam objectives is phased. So phased refers to an approach where the adoption or migration to cloud technology is carried out in incremental stages or phases. Instead of making a sudden and complete transition, like for example, rip and replace, organizations gradually introduce cloud-based solutions or services over time. Each phase focuses on specific objectives, such as migrating certain applications or workloads, testing and evaluating new cloud technologies, or onboarding specific teams or departments. The phased approach allows organizations to manage risks, ensure smooth integration, and gradually adapt to the changes brought by cloud technology without disrupting existing operations. We are now on to the third section, management and technical operations. We should be at the halfway point right now. So the first subject in here is data management, which refers to the processes and practices involving in storing, organizing, protecting, and accessing data in the cloud environment. It encompasses various activities such as data replication, data locality, and data backup to ensure data integrity, availability, and security. Next up, we have replication, which is creating copies of data and storing them in multiple locations or servers. The purpose of replication is to enhance data availability and resilience by ensuring the data can be accessed even if one server or location becomes unavailable. It helps in reducing the risk of data loss and improving the performance of applications that rely on quick data access. Next item is locality, which refers to the practice of storing data in geographic proximity to the users or applications that frequently access it. It aims to reduce data transfer latency and improve performance by minimizing the distance between the data and its customers. Data locality is particularly important for applications that require low latency and high responsiveness. Next, we have backup, which is the process of creating additional copies of data as a precautionary measure to protect against data loss or corruption. It is a process of regularly and systematically duplicating data and storing it in a separate location or storage medium. Backups can be used to restore data in the event of accidental deletion, hardware failure, or data corruption. Cloud technology offers robust backup solutions, allowing organizations to automate backup processes and securely store backup copies in the cloud. Next subject is availability, which refers to the ability of a system or service to remain accessible and operational for users. It ensures that the cloud infrastructure and services are reliable and can meet the demands of users without significant downtime or disruptions. Next item is zones or availability zones. They may call them one or the other. So zones refer to distinct isolated locations within a cloud provider's infrastructure. Each zone typically consists of multiple data centers in a specific geographic region. Zones are designed to be independent of each other, meaning that a failure or issue in one zone does not impact the availability of services in other zones. By spreading resources across different zones, cloud providers ensure high availability and fault tolerance, allowing applications to continue running even if one zone experiences problems. Next up, we have geo-redundancy, which involves replicating data and services across multiple geographical regions. It ensures that data and services are stored and replicated in different physical locations to mitigate the risk of data loss or service disruptions caused by natural disasters, power outages, or regional issues. Geo-redundancy provides additional resilience and availability by enabling failover and load balancing across different regions. In the event of an outage or disruption in one region, users can be seamlessly redirected to the replicated resources in another region, ensuring continuity of service. Next subject is disposable resources. So this refers to temporary or transient resources that can be created and destroyed on demand. These resources are typically used for specific tasks or workloads and are designed to be easily provisioned and deprovisioned. For example, in cloud computing, virtual machines or containers can be created and disposed of as needed, allowing organizations to allocate resources efficiently and reduce costs by only paying for what is used. Next, we have monitoring and visibility, which are uh, the ability to track and observe the performance, health, and usage of cloud resources and services. It includes collecting and analyzing data on various metrics, such as CPU utilization, network traffic, or application response time. By monitoring these metrics, organizations can gain insights into the behavior and performance of their cloud infrastructure and applications. Next up, we have alerts. So these are notifications or warnings triggered by a predefined threshold 
or condition. These alerts are sent to administrators or operators to inform them about potential issues or anomalies in the system. For example, an alert may be triggered if CPU usage exceeds a certain threshold or if there is a sudden spike in network traffic. Alerts help identify and address problems in a timely manner, allowing organizations to maintain the availability and performance of their cloud services. Next up, we have logging, which involves capturing and storing records or events related to system activities, user actions, or application behavior. These logs provide a detailed record of what is happening within the cloud environment, enabling troubleshooting, analysis, and auditing. Logging can include information such as error messages, system events, user interactions, or security incidents. Analyzing logs can help identify issues, track system behavior, and improve overall system performance. Next subject is optimization, and we're also going to discuss auto-scaling and right-sizing. So optimization is the process of fine-tuning and maximizing the performance efficiency, and cost-effectiveness of cloud resources and services. It involves analyzing and adjusting configurations, resource allocation, and workload management to ensure optimal utilization of cloud infrastructure. Two common optimization techniques are auto-scaling and right-sizing. So first is auto-scaling, which is a feature in cloud technology that allows resources to automatically scale up or down based on demand. It ensures that the right amount of resources are available to handle workload fluctuations. For example, if an application experiences a sudden increase in traffic, auto-scaling can automatically provision additional virtual machines to handle the load. Conversely, when the demand decreases, auto-scaling can reduce the number of resources to save costs. Right-sizing, on the other hand, is the optimization of the allocation of resources to match the needs of applications or workloads. It aims to ensure that resources are neither underutilized nor over-provisioned. By analyzing resource usage and performance data, organizations can right-size their infrastructure by adjusting the size or capacity of virtual machines, storage, or other resources. Right-sizing helps optimize costs and improve the efficiency of cloud deployments. So we've already been using this term, but the next one is provisioning, which refers to the process of setting up and configuring resources such as virtual machines, storage, or networks to support applications or services. It involves allocating and preparing the necessary infrastructure to ensure that it meets the requirements of the application or workload. Next item is Infrastructure as Code, or IAC. So this is an approach in cloud technology where infrastructure is defined and managed through machine-readable configuration files or scripts. It allows infrastructure to be provisioned, configured, and managed programmatically using tools like Terraform or CloudFormation. With IAC, infrastructure deployments become repeatable, version controlled, and automated, promoting consistency, scalability, and ease of management. Next item is templates. So these are predefined configurations or patterns used to create and provision resources. They provide a standardized and automated way of setting up infrastructure by specifying the desired settings, configurations, and dependencies. Templates can be used to deploy complex infrastructure environments such as virtual networks, load balancers, or server clusters quickly and consistently. CI, CD, continuous integration, continuous delivery, sometimes it's called continuous deployment. So this is a software development practice that involves automatically building, testing, and deploying applications in a continuous and automated manner. It enables developers to integrate their code changes frequently and automatically trigger a series of tests and deployment processes. CI-CD pipelines help ensure that code changes are thoroughly tested and deployed to production environments rapidly, enabling faster and more reliable software delivery. Next subject is testing in QA environments. So testing in QA or quality insurance environments refers to the process of validating and verifying the functionality, performance, and reliability of applications or systems in dedicated testing environments. These environments separate from production allow developers and testers to conduct various tests such as functional testing, performance testing, or security testing without impacting the live production environment. QA test number one, sandboxing. So this involves creating isolated and controlled environments for testing, experimentation, or development purposes. It allows developers or users to run applications or execute code within a safe and confined environment separate from the production environment. Sandboxing helps prevent potential risks or conflicts with the live system and enables testing or validation of new features 
or configurations. QA test number two is load testing. So this is a type of performance testing that assesses the behavior and performance of a system under varying levels of user demand or workload. It involves simulating a large number of concurrent users or high volumes of data to measure the system's response time, scalability, and resource utilization. Load testing helps identify performance bottlenecks and ensures that the system can handle the expected workload effectively. QA test number three, regression testing. So this is the process of retesting an application or system to ensure that recent code changes or modifications have not introduced unintended side effects or issues. It involves rerunning a set of predefined tests to verify that the existing functionality of the system remains intact after changes have been made. Regression testing helps maintain the quality and stability of the application, ensuring that new updates do not break previously working features. Next subject is configuration management. So this involves managing and maintaining the desired state and settings of software and infrastructure components. It includes activities such as defining and tracking configurations, enforcing consistency across environments, and ensuring that systems are properly configured and compliant with standards or policies. Next up, orchestration. So this refers to the coordination and management of multiple resources or services to achieve a specific goal or workflow. It involves automating and sequencing various tasks or actions across different components or systems. Orchestration ensures that the different parts of an application or system work together seamlessly, orchestrating the deployment, configuration, and scaling of resources as needed. Automation. This involves using technology to perform tasks or processes automatically without human intervention. It includes automating repetitive or manual tasks to improve efficiency, reduce errors, and save time. Automation can be applied to various aspects of cloud operations, such as provisioning resources, configuring infrastructure, or deploying applications. By automating these processes, organizations can streamline operations, increase productivity, and achieve consistent results. Upgrades and patching. This refers to the process of updating software, applications, or systems to newer versions or applying security patches to address vulnerabilities or bugs. It involves deploying the latest updates or fixes to ensure that the software or infrastructure is up to date and protected against known security risks. Upgrades and patching help improve performance, stability, and security by keeping the systems current with the latest features and fixes provided by vendors or developers. Next item is API integration. So this involves connecting different software systems or services using application programming interfaces or APIs. APIs enable communication and data exchange between applications, allowing them to interact and share information seamlessly. With API integration, organizations can leverage the capabilities of multiple systems, integrate cloud services with existing infrastructure, and automate workflows across different platforms. Storage refers to the allocation and management of data storage resources. Cloud storage offers scalable and flexible options for storing and accessing data over the internet. It allows organizations to store large amounts of data ranging from documents and files to databases and media files without the need for on-premises infrastructure. Cloud storage provides reliability, durability, and accessibility from anywhere, enabling efficient data management and collaboration. Network refers to the infrastructure and connectivity that enables communication between different cloud resources, users, and services. It includes the setup and configuration of virtual networks, subnets, routers, and firewalls within the cloud environment. Networks in the cloud enable secure and efficient data transmission, interconnectivity between resources, and the creation of isolated environments for improved security and performance. Compute refers to the processing power and resources used to run applications and perform computational tasks. It includes the provisioning and management of virtual machines or containers that execute the software and processes within the cloud environment. Compute resources in the cloud allow organizations to scale their computational power as needed, provision resources on demand, and optimize resource allocation for different workloads, or applications. Chargebacks refer to the process of allocating and attributing costs to specific users, departments, or projects based on their resource usage in the cloud. It involves tracking and measuring resource consumption, such as storage, compute, or network usage, and associating the cost with the responsible parties. Chargebacks help organizations gain visibility into resource utilization and enable fair cost allocation, promoting accountability and cost optimization. Next up, we have resource tagging, which involves assigning metadata or labels to cloud resources such as virtual machines, storage, or networks. 
Tags provide additional information about resources such as their purpose, owner, or their cost center. Resource tagging enables organizations to categorize and organize resources, track usage, and simplify resource management and cost allocation. Next, we have maintenance, which refers to the activities performed to ensure the smooth operation, performance, and security of cloud resources and services. It includes regular updates, patches, and security fixes to keep systems up to date and protected against vulnerabilities. Maintenance also involves monitoring and managing the health and availability of resources, conducting routine backups, and implementing disaster recovery measures. By performing maintenance tasks, organizations can prevent issues, optimize performance, and ensure the reliability of their cloud infrastructure. Next subject is instances. So instances refer to virtual machines or containers that are created and used to run applications or services in the cloud. Instances provide the necessary computing resources such as processing power, memory, and storage to support the execution of software. They can be provisioned on demand, scaled up or down, and terminated as needed. So we're going to discuss two types of instances. Number one is reserved instances, which are a purchasing option where users commit to a specific instance type, region, and duration, usually for one to three years in exchange for a lower hourly rate. By reserving instances in advance, users can secure a discounted price compared to the regular on-demand rates. Reserved instances are suitable for workloads that have predictable and steady resource requirements over an extended period. Next type of instances we're going to discuss are spot instances. So this is a purchasing option where users can bid on unused or spare computing capacity in the cloud provider's data centers. Spot instances offer significantly lower prices compared to on-demand instances, but are subject to availability and can be reclaimed by the cloud provider with a short notice period. Spot instances are suitable for workloads that are flexible and can tolerate interruptions or temporary loss of resources. Next up, we have licensing type and licensing quantity which we've kind of briefly touched on before. Licensing type refers to the specific licensing model or agreement for software used in the cloud. It determines the terms and conditions for deploying and using licensed software in cloud environments where different licensing types may include bring your own license where users bring their existing licenses to the cloud or subscription-based licenses where users pay a recurring fee to use the software in the cloud. And then we have licensing quantity, which refers to the number of licenses required to run software in the cloud. It represents the number of instances or users that can access and use the licensed software simultaneously. The licensing quantity is determined by the licensing agreement or terms specified by the software vendor and must be compliant with the licensing policies and restrictions. Section four now, governance, risk, compliance, and security. Very exciting stuff, I know. So first we have risk assessment, which refers to the process of identifying, evaluating, and mitigating potential risks and vulnerabilities associated with the use of cloud services. It involves analyzing the likelihood and impact of various risks, such as data breaches, service disruptions, or compliance violations. Risk assessment helps organizations understand and prioritize risks, develop appropriate mitigation strategies, and ensure the security and resilience of their cloud environments. Asset inventory involves creating a comprehensive list of the assets or resources within a cloud environment. It includes identifying and documenting various components such as virtual machines, storage, databases or applications and their associated configurations and dependencies. Asset inventory provides visibility into the cloud infrastructure, helps track resources and enables effective management, monitoring and security of the assets. Classification refers to categorizing data, applications, or systems based on their sensitivity or criticality. It involves labeling or tagging assets with appropriate security classifications such as public, internal, confidential, or highly sensitive. Classification helps organizations apply appropriate security controls, access permissions, and data protection measures based on the sensitivity level of the assets. Ownership is identifying and assigning responsibility for the management and protection of cloud resources. It involves determining who has the authority and accountability for specific assets or systems within the cloud environment. Ownership ensures that there are clear roles and responsibilities for maintaining the security, compliance, and operational aspects of the cloud resources. It helps establish accountability and facilitates effective decision-making and governance. Next subject is risk response, uh, and then we have a couple of different subtopics on this one. So risk response in cloud technology refers to the actions taken to address identified risks and minimize their potential impact on the organization. It involves implementing strategies and measures to reduce the likelihood of consequences of those risks. Risk response aims to protect assets, 
maintain operations, and ensure business continuity in the face of potential threats. Risk response strategy number one is mitigation. So this focuses on reducing the probability or the impact of a risk. It involves implementing controls, safeguards, or preventative measures to minimize the likelihood of a risk event occurring or to reduce its potential consequences. Mitigation measures can include implementing security controls, backup and recovery solutions, redundancy, or training programs to mitigate the identified risks. Risk response strategy number two is acceptance. So this is where an organization acknowledges the existence of a risk, but decides not to take any specific action to mitigate it. This strategy is typically chosen when the cost or effort required to address the risk is deemed higher than the potential impact. Acceptance does not mean ignoring the risk completely, but rather consciously deciding to tolerate the risk and focus resources on higher priority risks or more critical areas. Risk response strategy number three is risk avoidance. This aims to eliminate or avoid the occurrence of a risk altogether. It involves making decisions or taking actions that prevent the organization from being exposed to the risk in the first place. Avoidance can include choosing not to engage in certain activities or practices that carry high risks, or opting for alternative approaches or technologies that are less risky. Risk response strategy number four is risk transfer. So this seems to be the favorite in the business world. This is a risk response strategy where the organization transfers the responsibility for the risk to another party. This can be done through contractual agreements, insurance policies, or outsourcing certain activities to third-party service providers. Transferring the risk does not eliminate it entirely, but it shifts the financial or operational consequences to another entity that is better equipped to handle or manage the risk. Now on to documentation, of course, everyone's favorite. So this refers to the process of recording and organizing information related to various aspects of the cloud environment. It involves capturing details, instructions, procedures, configurations, and other relevant data to provide a reference for future use. Documentation helps in understanding and maintaining the cloud infrastructure facilitates effective collaboration, and ensures consistency and accuracy in cloud operations. We have two subtopics under documentation. Number one is findings, which refers to the results or outcomes of assessments, audits, or investigations related to the cloud environment. These findings highlight areas of concern, vulnerabilities, or non-compliance with established policies or standards. Findings can include security gaps, performance bottlenecks, or areas requiring improvement. Documenting findings helps organizations identify and prioritize necessary actions to address the identified issues and enhance the overall security and performance of the cloud environment. The second subtopic under documentation is risk register. So this is a centralized document or database that captures and tracks all identified risks within the cloud environment. It provides a structured framework for documenting risks, their likelihood, potential impact, and current risk mitigation strategies. The risk register helps organizations maintain an overview of the risks they face, assess their risk exposure, and track the progress of risk mitigation efforts. It's a valuable tool for risk management, decision making, and ongoing risk monitoring and reporting. Next subject is vendor lock-in, which refers to a situation in cloud technology where an organization becomes highly dependent on a particular cloud service provider's technologies, tools, or proprietary APIs. It can limit the organization's flexibility and make it challenging to switch to another provider or migrate to different platforms. Vendor lock-in can result in higher costs, reduced interoperability, and potential difficulties in integrating with other systems or adopting new technologies. Next up, we have data portability, which refers to the ability to move or transfer data between different cloud platforms or service providers easily. It ensures that organizations have control over their data and can migrate it to alternative cloud environments without significant barriers. Data portability enables flexibility, avoids vendor lock-in, and allows organizations to choose the best cloud solutions for their needs while maintaining data integrity and accessibility. Next, we have standard operating procedures, which are established guidelines and documented instructions that define how specific tasks, processes, or operations should be carried out within the cloud environment. SOPs provide a consistent and standardized approach to ensure efficiency, reliability, and compliance with best practices. They help streamline operations, enhance productivity, and promote uniformity in the execution of tasks across the organization. 
Next, we have change management. So this refers to the process of planning, implementing, and controlling changes to the cloud environment in a structured and controlled manner. It involves assessing the impact of changes, managing potential risks, and communicating and coordinating with stakeholders. Change management ensures that modifications, updates, or new deployments in the cloud environment are properly evaluated, tested, and implemented to minimize disruptions, maintain stability, and align with business objectives. Next up, we have resource management, which is the practice of effectively allocating and optimizing computing resources, such as virtual machines, storage, and network bandwidth within the cloud environment. It includes monitoring resource usage, scaling resources up or down based on demand, and ensuring efficient utilization to maximize performance and cost effectiveness. Resource management helps organizations optimize their cloud infrastructure, improve scalability, and achieve optimal resource allocation for their workloads. Security policies. This is a set of rules, guidelines, and procedures that define how security measures and controls are implemented and enforced within the cloud environment. They establish the framework for protecting data, applications, and infrastructure from unauthorized access, data breaches, or other security threats. Security policies encompass various aspects, including user authentication, data encryption, access controls, incident response, and compliance requirements. Next up, incident response, which refers to the process of identifying, managing, and resolving security incidents or breaches that occur within the cloud environment. It involves detecting and analyzing security events, containing and mitigating the impact, and restoring normal operations. Incident response plans outline the steps to be taken, the roles and responsibilities of stakeholders, and the communication and remediation procedures to address security incidents effectively. Next up, we have access and control policies, which define the rules and permissions governing user access and usage of resources within the cloud environment. These policies outline who has access to specific data, applications, or systems, and what actions they are allowed to perform or restricted from performing. Access and control policies help enforce security, prevent unauthorized access, and ensure compliance with regulatory requirements. Department-specific policies are policies that are tailored to meet the unique needs and requirements of specific departments or functional areas within an organization. These policies address department-specific considerations such as data access, storage or usage requirements, and align with the overall organizational policies and standards. Department-specific policies help ensure that each department can effectively and securely leverage cloud technology while adhering to relevant guidelines and regulations. Communication policies govern the secure and appropriate communication and sharing of information within the cloud environment. These policies define protocols for data transmission, encryption standards, and guidelines for sharing sensitive or confidential information. Communication policies ensure the privacy, integrity, and confidentiality of data and promote secure collaboration and information exchange within the cloud environment. Data sovereignty refers to the legal and regulatory requirements that govern where data can be stored, processed or transferred. It relates to the jurisdictional control over data and ensures that organizations comply with the data protection laws of specific countries or regions. Data sovereignty policies and considerations are essential in cloud technology to ensure compliance with applicable regulations and protect sensitive data from unauthorized access or disclosure. Regulatory concerns. These refer to the compliance requirements imposed by industry-specific or government regulations. These concerns include data privacy, security, financial regulations, healthcare regulations, or other industry-specific guidelines. Compliance with regulatory requirements is crucial to avoid legal implications, financial penalties, or reputational damage. Organizations must understand and address these regulatory concerns when adopting cloud technology to ensure compliance and data protection. Next item is industry-based requirements. So these are specific guidelines or standards that apply to particular sectors or industries. These requirements address unique considerations related to data privacy, security, compliance, or operational practices that are specific to a particular industry. Examples include the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, PCI DSS for the financial industry or the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA for the healthcare industry. Adhering to industry-based requirements is crucial to maintaining the integrity and security of data within the cloud environment. International standards. These are guidelines or benchmarks established by recognized organizations such as the International Organization of Standardization, ISO, to promote best practices and ensure consistency across different cloud service providers and regions. These standards address various aspects, including data security, privacy, 
interoperability, and service reliability. Adhering to international standards helps organizations assess and compare cloud services, ensure quality, and meet globally recognized best practices. Next one is rather ironic certifications, which refer to recognized credentials that validate an individual or organization's knowledge, skills, and compliance with specific standards or best practices in cloud computing. These certifications are typically awarded by reputable organizations and demonstrate experience in areas such as cloud architecture, security, governance, or compliance. Cloud certifications help organizations identify qualified professionals and demonstrate their commitment to maintaining high standards of performance and security. Next, we have threats. So a threat refers to any potential event or action that can exploit vulnerabilities and negatively impact the security, availability, or integrity of data and systems within the cloud environment. Threats can include malicious attacks, unauthorized access, data breaches, malware infections, or natural disasters. Understanding and identifying threats is crucial for implementing appropriate security measures and mitigating the associated risks. Vulnerability. This refers to a weakness or flaw in the cloud infrastructure, applications, or configurations that can be exploited by threats. Vulnerabilities can arise due to poor coding practices, misconfigurations, outdated software, or inadequate security controls. Identifying and addressing vulnerabilities is essential to minimize the risk of security breaches and ensure the overall integrity and reliability of the cloud environment. Security assessments in cloud technology involve evaluating the security posture and identifying potential vulnerabilities or weaknesses within the cloud infrastructure. These assessments aim to assess the effectiveness of security controls, policies and procedures in mitigating risks and safeguarding data. Security assessments typically involve various techniques and tools to identify potential vulnerabilities, including penetration testing, vulnerability scanning, and application scanning. Penetration testing, also known as pen testing, is a security assessment technique that involves simulating real-world attacks on the cloud infrastructure or applications. Pen testing aims to identify and exploit vulnerabilities to assess the effectiveness of security measures and evaluate the potential impact of successful attacks. It helps organizations understand their security weaknesses and take appropriate measures to enhance their security defenses. Vulnerability scanning is a security assessment technique that involves using automated tools to identify known vulnerabilities within the cloud infrastructure or applications. Vulnerability scanning scans the environment for potential weaknesses and generates a report listing the identified vulnerabilities. It helps organizations identify and address security vulnerabilities before they are exploited by malicious actors. Application scanning, also known as application security testing, is a security assessment technique that focuses on identifying vulnerabilities and weaknesses specific to cloud-based applications. It involves analyzing the code, configurations, and behavior of applications to identify potential security flaws such as input validation errors, insecure data storage, or inadequate access controls. Application scanning helps ensure that cloud-based applications are developed and deployed securely. Next subject is data security. So this refers to the protection of data from unauthorized access, use, disclosure, alteration, or destruction. It involves implementing measures to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data throughout its life cycle. Data security categorizes data based on its sensitivity and level of protection required. Common categories include public data, non-sensitive and publicly accessible, private data, restricted access to authorized users, and sensitive data, which is confidential and requiring strict access controls. Confidentiality is a data security principle that ensures that sensitive or confidential information is accessed only by authorized individuals or systems. It involves implementing access controls, encryption, and other measures to prevent unauthorized disclosure or access to sensitive data. Encryption is a technique used to convert data into a coded form, making it unreadable without a decryption key. It helps protect data confidentiality by ensuring that even if unauthorized individuals gain access to the data, they cannot understand its contents. Sanitization refers to the process of permanently removing data from storage devices or systems to ensure that it cannot be recovered. It's important when disposing of or reusing storage media to prevent unauthorized access to sensitive information. Data integrity ensures that data remains accurate, complete, and unaltered throughout its life cycle. It involves implementing measures to prevent unauthorized modifications such as using checksums or digital signatures to detect data tampering. Data validation is the process of verifying the accuracy and reliability of data. It involves checks and validations to ensure that data is complete, 
consistent, and meets predefined criteria or business rules. Availability refers to ensuring that data and systems are accessible and usable when needed. It involves implementing redundancy, backup, and disaster recovery measures to minimize downtime and ensure continuous access to data. Backup is the process of creating copies of data to be stored in a separate location or system. It provides a means to restore data in case of accidental deletion, data corruption, or system failures. Recovery refers to the process of restoring data and systems to a functional state after a disruption or data loss event. It involves retrieving data from backups, repairing systems, and resuming normal operations. A data breach occurs when unauthorized individuals gain access to sensitive or confidential data. It can result in data exposure, theft, or misuse. Data breaches can lead to financial losses, reputational damage, and legal consequences. Next subject, application and infrastructure security. So this involves implementing measures to protect the applications and underlying infrastructure from security threats and vulnerabilities. It focuses on securing the software applications and the physical or virtual infrastructure on which they run. Audit refers to the process of reviewing and assessing the security controls, configurations, and activities within the cloud environment. It involves examining logs, conducting security assessments, and verifying compliance with security policies and regulatory requirements. Audits help identify potential vulnerabilities or weaknesses and ensure that security measures are effectively implemented. Access control is the process of granting or denying permissions to individuals or systems to access resources within the cloud environment. It involves implementing mechanisms such as user authentication, role-based access control, or RBAC, or access control lists, ACLs to ensure that only authorized entities can access specific resources. Authorization is the process of granting permissions to authorized users or systems based on their authenticated identity. It determines what actions or operations a user or system is allowed to perform within the cloud environment. Authorization ensures that individuals or systems have the necessary privileges to carry out specific tasks and restricts unauthorized access to sensitive resources. Hardening refers to the process of strengthening the security of applications and infrastructure by minimizing the potential vulnerabilities. It involves configuring systems and applications in a secure manner, removing unnecessary or insecure services, and applying security patches and updates regularly. Hardening measures aim to reduce the attack service and enhance the overall security posture of the cloud environment. So now that we're done with the four main sections of the exam, we're going to move on to abbreviations and we're also going to make sure all of them are defined. And then I've included some extra information at the very end, which I think is going to be both important on the exam and then also when you get out into the field. AI or artificial intelligence refers to the simulation of human intelligence in machines that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence, such as learning, problem solving, perception, and decision making. AI systems use techniques like machine learning, natural language processing, and computer vision to analyze data, make predictions, and automate complex processes. API, or Application Programming Interface, is a set of rules and protocols that allows different software applications to communicate and interact with each other. It defines the methods and data formats that applications can use to request and exchange information. APIs enable developers to access and utilize the functionality of other applications or services without having to understand their internal workings. ASP or Application Service Provider refers to a company or service provider that hosts and delivers software applications over the internet to customers. Instead of installing and maintaining the software on their own systems, customers can access and use the applications through a web browser. ASPs typically offer software as a subscription on a pay-per-use basis. BPAAS or Business Process as a Service is a cloud computing model that provides business process outsourcing services over the internet. It allows organizations to outsource specific specific business processes such as human resources, payroll, or customer support to a cloud service provider. BPAAS providers offer those services on demand, allowing organizations to scale and customize their business processes as needed. BYOL, or Bring Your Own License, refers to a licensing model in which customers bring their existing software licenses to use in the cloud environment. It allows organizations to leverage their existing investments in software licenses and use them in cloud-based infrastructure or applications, rather than purchasing new licenses from the cloud service provider. 
CAAS, or Communications as a Service, is a cloud computing model that provides communication services over the internet. It allows organizations to access and utilize communication tools and services such as voice and video conferencing, messaging, and collaboration platforms without the need for on-premises infrastructure. CAAS providers deliver these services on a subscription or pay-per-use basis. CDN, or Content Delivery Network, is a geographically distributed network of servers that delivers web content such as images, videos, and static files to users based on their geographic location. CDNs help improve the performance and availability of web content by reducing latency and minimizing the load on origin servers. They store cached copies of content in multiple locations, allowing users to access content from the nearest server. CFO, or Chief Financial Officer, is a senior executive responsible for managing the financial activities and strategies of an organization. They oversee financial planning, budgeting, reporting, and decision-making to ensure the financial health and stability of the organization. The CFO plays a crucial role in assessing the financial impact of technology investments, including cloud services, on the organization's overall budget and profitability. CICD, or Continuous Integration, Continuous Delivery, or Continuous Deployment, is a software development approach that emphasizes frequent and automated integration, testing, and deployment of code changes. Continuous integration involves regularly merging code changes into a shared repository and automatically running tests to detect integration issues. Continuous delivery focuses on automating the deployment process to ensure that software changes can be reliably and rapidly delivered to production environments. CIO, or Chief Information Officer, is a senior executive responsible for managing the information technology strategy and operations of an organization. They oversee the planning, implementation, and management of technology systems and services to support the organization's goals and objectives. The CIO plays a key role in evaluating and adopting cloud technologies to drive innovation, improve operational efficiency, and align IT initiatives with business objectives. CISO, or Chief Information Security Officer, is a senior executive responsible for overseeing and managing the information security and cybersecurity efforts of an organization. They develop and implement security strategies, policies, and procedures to protect the organization's data, systems, and networks from unauthorized access, breaches, and cyber threats. The CISO works to identify and mitigate security risks, ensures compliance with regulations and standards, and educates employees on security best practices. CLI, or Command Line Interface, is a text-based user interface that allows users to interact with a computer system or software by typing commands into a terminal or command prompt. It provides a way to execute commands, run programs, and perform various tasks by entering specific commands and parameters. The CLI is often used by developers, system administrators, and power users to manage and configure computer systems efficiently. CMS, or Content Management System, is a software application or platform that allows users to create manage, and publish digital content on the web. It provides tools and features for content creation, editing, organization, and publishing, enabling users to build and maintain websites, blogs, and online stores without extensive programming knowledge. CMS platforms often offer templates, plugins, and user-friendly interfaces to simplify content management and website customization. CPU, or Central Processing Unit, is the primary component of a computer system responsible for executing instructions and performing calculations. It's often referred to as the brain of the computer. The CPU interprets and executes instructions from a computer's memory, performs arithmetic and logical operations, and manages data movement between different components. It plays a crucial role in determining the performance and processing power of a computer. CRM, or or customer relationship management is a system or strategy used by businesses to manage and analyze interactions with their customers and prospects. It involves collecting and organizing customer data, tracking customer interactions, and managing customer relationships throughout the customer lifecycle. CRM systems provide tools for sales, marketing, and customer service teams to improve customer engagement, automate processes, and drive customer satisfaction and loyalty. CSP, or Cloud Service Provider, is a company or organization that offers cloud computing services and resources to individuals or businesses. CSPs provide infrastructure, platforms, software, and other services over the internet, allowing customers to access and utilize computing resources on demand without the need for extensive on-premises infrastructure. Examples of CSPs include Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, 
and Google Cloud Platform. CTO or Chief Technology Officer is a senior executive responsible for overseeing and managing the technology strategy and operations of an organization. They evaluate and adopt new technologies, identify opportunities for innovation, and align technology initiatives with business goals. The CTO works closely with other executives to ensure that technology solutions support the organization's growth, efficiency, and competitive advantage. They are responsible for driving technological advancements and managing the IT infrastructure and systems of the organization. DBAAS, or Database as a Service, is a cloud computing model where a cloud service provider manages and provides access to a database environment to users over the internet. Users can store, manage, and access their data using the database services offered by the provider without having to worry about the underlying infrastructure and maintenance tasks. DBAAS eliminates the need for organizations to set up and manage their own database servers, allowing them to focus on utilizing the database for their applications and data analysis. DDoS, otherwise known as Distributed Denial of Service, or DDoS, is a type of cyber attack where multiple compromised computers are used to flood a target system or network with a massive volume of traffic, rendering it unavailable to legitimate users. The aim of a DDoS attack is to disrupt the normal functioning of website, service, or network by overwhelming it with a flood of requests or data. DDoS attacks can cause downtime, loss of business, and damage to the reputation of the targeted entity. DNS, otherwise known as Domain Name Service or Domain Name System, is a system that translates domain names such as Google.com into the corresponding IP addresses that computers use to communicate over the internet. It acts as a directory service that enables users to access websites and other online resources by using easy-to-remember domain names instead of numerical IP addresses. The DNS plays a critical role in internet infrastructure, allowing users to navigate the web and access resources using human-friendly domain names. DR, or Disaster Recovery, refers to the process and strategies implemented to recover and restore IT systems and data after a catastrophic event such as natural disasters, hardware failures, or cyber attacks. It involves creating backups of critical data, implementing redundant systems and infrastructure, and developing recovery plans and procedures to minimize downtime and ensure business continuity. DR aims to restore normal operations as quickly as possible and protect the organization's data and IT resources in the event of a disaster. ERP, or Enterprise Resource Planning, is a software system that integrates various business processes and functions, such as finance, human resources, inventory management, and supply chain management into a unified platform. It allows organizations to streamline and automate their operations, improve efficiency, and gain better visibility into their business processes. ERP systems provide a centralized database and a suite of applications that enable cross-functional collaboration and data sharing within the organization. EULA, or End User License Agreement, is a legal contract between a software vendor or copyright holder and an end user of the software. It outlines the terms and conditions under which the software can be used, including the rights and limitations of the user, intellectual property rights, warranty disclaimers, and liability provisions. Users are typically required to accept the EULA before installing or using the software. FTP, or File Transfer Protocol, is a standard network protocol used for transferring files between a client and a server on a computer network. It provides a simple and efficient way to upload, download, and manage files across different systems. FTP uses a client-server architecture and operates on a set of predefined commands for file transfer and directory navigation. It's commonly used for website maintenance, software distribution, and file sharing. GUI, or Graphical User Interface, is a visual interface that allows users to interact with software applications using graphical elements such as icons, menus, and windows rather than text-based commands. GUI provides a user-friendly and intuitive way to navigate and control applications, enabling users to perform tasks by clicking buttons, selecting options, and manipulating graphical elements. It enhances the user experience and simplifies the interaction between users and a computer system or software applications. HTTPS Hypertext Transport Protocol Secure, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, is a secure version of HTTP used for transmitting data over the internet. It combines the HTTP protocol with SSL and TLS. TLS encryption to ensure secure communication between a client, such as a web browser, and a server. HTTPS is commonly used for secure online transactions such as e-commerce websites, online banking, and any other applications that require the protection of sensitive information. IaaS, or Infrastructure as a Service, is a cloud computing model where a cloud service provider offers virtualized computing resources over the internet. It provides users with access to virtual machines, storage, 
networks, and other fundamental IT infrastructure components. With IAS, users can deploy and manage their applications and services on the provider's infrastructure, eliminating the need to invest in and maintain their own physical hardware. It offers flexibility, scalability, and cost-effectiveness as users can scale their infrastructure resources up or down based on their needs. IoT, or Internet of Things, refers to the network of physical objects, devices, and sensors embedded with connectivity, software, and sensors that enable them to collect and exchange data over the Internet. These objects can be everyday devices such as smart thermostats, wearable devices, or industrial equipment. IoT enables these devices to communicate with each other and with centralized systems, allowing for automation, remote monitoring, and data analysis. It has applications in various domains including smart homes, healthcare, transportation, and manufacturing. IP or Internet Protocol is a network protocol that enables devices to communicate and exchange data over the Internet. It provides a unique identification for each device connected to a network and defines rules for addressing, routing, and fragmenting data packets. IP is the foundation of the Internet, allowing computers and other devices to send and receive information across interconnected networks. ISO, or International Organization for Standardization, is an international standard-setting organization that develops and publishes standards across various industries and domains. ISO standards provide guidelines, specifications, and best practices for ensuring quality, safety, efficiency, and interoperability of products, services, and systems. In the context of cloud technology, ISO standards may cover areas such as information security, data management, and service management. ISP, or Internet Service Provider, is a company or organization that provides internet connectivity services to individuals, businesses, and other entities. ISPs offer various types of internet connections such as broadband, DSL, cable, or wireless, allowing users to access the internet and connect to online services. ISPs play a crucial role in enabling users to access and utilize cloud services and other internet-based technologies. ITAAS, or Information Technology as a Service. This is a cloud computing model where IT resources and services are delivered to users over the internet on a subscription or pay-as-you-go basis. It encompasses the delivery of various IT services such as software, infrastructure, platforms, storage, and security as a service. ITAAS allows organizations to outsource their IT needs to service providers, reducing the need for on-premises infrastructure and providing greater flexibility and scalability. ITIL, or Information Technology Infrastructure Library, is a framework of best practices for IT service management. It provides a set of guidelines and concepts for planning, delivering, and managing IT services effectively and efficiently. ITIL covers various aspects of IT service management, including service strategy, design, transition, operation, and continual improvement. It helps organizations align their IT services with business goals, improve service quality, and optimize IT operations. JSON, or JavaScript Object Notation, is a lightweight data interchange format that is easy for humans to read and write and for machines to parse and generate. It's based on a subset of JavaScript programming language syntax and is commonly used for transmitting data between a server and a web application as an alternative to XML. JSON, or JSON, represents data in a key-value pair format and supports various data types including strings, numbers, booleans, arrays, and objects. KVM, or Kernel Virtual Machine, is an open-source virtualization technology that allows the creation and management of virtual machines on Linux operating systems. It leverages the virtualization extensions of the host CPU to provide hardware-assisted virtualization, enabling efficient and secure virtualization of multiple operating systems on a single host machine. KVM operates as a kernel module and works in conjunction with a hypervisor to provide the necessary infrastructure for running virtual machines. LDAP, or Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, is a protocol used for accessing and managing directory services. It provides a standard way to interact with directory servers that store and organize information such as user accounts, authentication credentials, and network resources. LDAP allows clients to perform operations like searching, adding, modifying, and deleting entries in the directory. It is widely used for user authentication, directory services, and centralized management of network resources. MAAS, or Monitoring as a Service, is a cloud-based service that provides monitoring and management of IT infrastructure and applications. It involves the remote monitoring of systems, networks, servers, and other resources to track their performance, availability, and health. MAAS typically involves the collection and analysis of monitoring data, generating alerts and notifications, and providing insights into the overall health and performance of the monitored infrastructure. It helps organizations ensure the smooth operation of their IT systems and proactively identify and address potential issues. 
MFA or multi-factor authentication is a security mechanism that requires users to provide multiple forms of identification to verify their identity. Instead of relying solely on a username and password, MFA combines two or more authentication factors such as passwords, biometrics, security tokens, or single-use keys to enhance the security of access to systems and applications. MFA adds an extra layer of protection making it more difficult for unauthorized individuals to gain access to sensitive data or resources. ML or machine learning is a field of artificial intelligence that focuses on the development of algorithms and models that enable computer systems to learn from and make predictions or decisions based on data. ML algorithms analyze and identify patterns and relationships within large data sets to recognize and learn from patterns, allowing the system to improve its performance or behavior over time without explicit programming. ML has applications in various domains such as image and speech recognition, natural language processing, recommendation systems, and predictive analytics. MSP or Managed Service Provider is a company or organization that provides proactive IT management and support services to clients. MSPs remotely monitor, manage, and maintain their clients' IT infrastructure, networks, and systems ensuring their smooth operation and minimizing downtime. MSPs offer services such as network monitoring, cybersecurity, data backup and recovery, software updates, and help desk support. By outsourcing their IT needs to an MSP, organizations can focus on their core business activities while relying on the expertise and resources of the MSP to manage their IT environment. MTTR, or Mean Time to Repair, is a metric used to measure the average time required to repair a system or resolve an issue after it's been reported or detected. It's commonly used in IT and technical support to assess the efficiency and effectiveness of incident response and problem resolution processes. A lower MTTR indicates a faster response and resolution time, which is desirable to minimize service disruptions and restore normal operations promptly. OEM, or Original Equipment Manufacturer, is a company that manufactures and sells products or components that are used in the production of another company's products. For example, an OEM may produce computer chips that are used by computer manufacturers to build their devices. OEM products are often sold under the branding or labeling of the purchasing company rather than the OEM's own brand. OS, or Operating System, is a software program or a collection of software components that manages and controls the software and software resources of a computer system. It provides a platform for running applications and facilitates the interaction between the user and the computer. The OS performs tasks such as managing memory, handling input and output devices, scheduling processes, providing file management, and ensuring system security. Examples of popular operating systems include Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and Android. PaaS, or Platform as a Service, is a cloud computing service model that provides a platform and environment for developers to build, deploy, and manage applications. PaaS offers a complete development and runtime environment including infrastructure, middleware, development tools, and services without the need for organizations to manage or maintain the underlying infrastructure. It allows developers to focus on writing code and developing applications without worrying about the complexities of infrastructure setup and management. PaaS platforms typically provide features such as application hosting, scalability, automatic updates, and integration with other cloud services. PII, or Personal Identifiable Information, refers to any information that can be used to identify an individual. This can include personal details such as names, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, social security numbers, and financial information. PII is sensitive and requires protection to prevent unauthorized access, use, or disclosure. Organizations that collect and process PII are often subject to privacy regulations and must implement appropriate security measures to safeguard this information from data breaches and misuse. POC, or Proof of Concept, is a small-scale demonstration or experiment that aims to verify the feasibility and practicality of a concept, idea, or technology. It involves building a prototype or implementing a limited version of a product or solution to test its functionalities and validate its potential. The purpose of a POC is to assess the technical feasibility, performance, and viability of an innovation before investing significant resources in its full-scale development. POV, or Proof of Value, is a demonstration or evaluation that aims to prove the business value and benefits of a product, solution, or initiative. It goes beyond the technical aspects and focuses on showcasing the value proposition and potential impact on business outcomes. A POV typically involves implementing and testing a solution in a real-world or simulated environment to gather data and evidence of its effectiveness. The goal of a POV is to provide stakeholders with a tangible evidence of the value that can be derived from adopting a particular technology or solution.
QA or quality assurance is a process or set of activities that ensures that products or services meet specified quality standards and customer requirements. It involves systematic monitoring, evaluation, and improvement of processes and practices to prevent defects, errors, or deviations from quality standards. QA typically includes activities such as defining quality criteria, creating test plans, executing tests, identifying and reporting issues, and implementing corrective actions to enhance the overall quality and reliability of products or services. QoS, or quality of service, refers to the ability of a network or system to provide specific performance characteristics and meet predefined service requirements. It focuses on ensuring the network or system delivers reliable, consistent, and predictable performance, particularly in terms of factors such as bandwidth, latency, packet loss, and prioritization of traffic. QoS mechanisms provide critical data or applications over less important traffic, ensuring that essential services or applications receive the necessary resources and perform optimally. RDP, or Remote Desktop Protocol, is a proprietary protocol developed by Microsoft that allows users to remotely access and control a computer or virtual machine over a network connection. It enables a user to view and interact with the remote desktop environment as if they were physically present at the computer. RDP provides remote access capabilities for tasks such as software maintenance, technical support, and remote collaboration. RFI, or Request for Information, is a formal process or document used to gather information from potential vendors or suppliers about their products, services, or capabilities. It's often a preliminary step in the procurement process where organizations seek detailed information to understand the vendor's landscape, assess potential solutions, and gather data to inform their decision-making. RFIs typically include questions about the vendor's expertise, experience, technology, pricing, and other relevant factors. RFP, or Request for Proposal, is a formal document or solicitation used to invite vendors or suppliers to submit detailed proposals outlining their solutions, pricing, and terms in response to specific requirements or needs of an organization. It's a common method for organizations to gather competitive bids or offers from potential vendors and evaluate them based on criteria such as functionality, cost, timeline, support, and other factors. RFPs provide a structured approach to procurement and enable organizations to compare and select the most suitable vendor for their project or initiative. ROI, or Return on Investment, is a financial metric that measures the profitability or value generated by an investment relative to its cost. It's typically expressed as a percentage and represents the net gain or loss resulting from an investment compared to the initial investment amount. ROI helps organizations assess the efficiency and effectiveness of their investments and determine whether they are generating positive returns. A higher ROI indicates a more favorable investment outcome, while a negative ROI indicates a loss. RPO, or Recovery Point Objective, is a metric that defines the maximum tolerable amount of data loss or the point in time to which data must be recovered after a disruption or incident. It represents the amount of data that an organization is willing to accept losing in the event of a failure. RPO is usually defined in terms of time, such as within the last 24 hours or up to the last backup. Organizations use RPO to determine the frequency of data backups and replication mechanisms needed to meet their recovery objectives. RTO, or Recovery Time Objective, is a metric that defines the maximum acceptable downtime, or the time it takes to recover and restore systems, applications, or services after a disruption or incident. It represents the target time frame within which operations must be resumed to minimize the impact of a disruption. RTO is typically measured in terms of elapsed time, such as within four hours or within one business day. Organizations use RTO to plan and implement appropriate recovery strategies and technologies to meet their business continuity goals. SaaS, or Software as a Service, is a software delivery model in which applications are provided to users over the internet as a service. Instead of installing and maintaining software on individual computers or servers, users access the software through web browser or thin client. SaaS eliminates the need for users to manage the underlying infrastructure and allows them to use software on a subscription basis, typically paying a recurring fee. The SaaS provider hosts and maintains the software, handles updates and upgrades, and ensures availability and security. SAN, or Storage Area Network, is a specialized network architecture that provides high-speed access to shared storage resources. It enables multiple servers or computing devices to access and share data storage devices such as disk arrays or tape libraries over a dedicated network. SANs offer centralized storage management, improved data availability, and scalability. They are commonly used in enterprise environments to support large-scale data storage requirements such as database servers, virtualization platforms, and high-performance computing. 
SDN, or Software Defined Network, is an approach to network management and control that separates the control plane from the data plane in networking devices. It centralizes network control and management functions, allowing administrators to programmatically configure and manage network devices through software. SDN decouples network control logic from individual network devices, making networks more flexible, scalable, and programmable. It enables organizations to optimize network performance, automate network provisioning, and implement dynamic network policies. SFTP, or Secure File Transfer Protocol, is a method which provides a secure and encrypted method for transferring files over a network. It combines the features of FTP, or File Transfer Protocol, with the security of SSH, Secure Shell. SFTP encrypts data during transit, preventing unauthorized access or interception. It's commonly used for secure file transfers in situations where data confidentiality and integrity are critical, such as transferring sensitive files or conducting secure backups. SLA, or Service Level Agreement, is a contractual agreement between a service provider and a customer that defines the level of service, performance, and support that the provider will deliver. It outlines specific service targets such as availability, response time, and resolution time, and establishes the responsibilities of both parties. SLAs help ensure that services meet the agreed-upon standards and provide a basis for measuring and monitoring service performance. They often include provisions for penalties or remedies in case of service level breaches. SNMP, or Simple Network Management Protocol, is a protocol used for managing and monitoring network devices and systems. It provides a standardized framework for collecting and organizing information about network devices, such as routers, switches, and servers, and allows for remote monitoring and configuration. SNMP enables network administrators to gather performance statistics, monitor device health, and receive notifications about network events or issues. It's widely used for network management and monitoring in enterprise and service provider environments. SOA, or Service Oriented Architecture, is an architectural approach that structures software systems as a collection of loosely coupled and interoperable services. Services in SOA are self-contained and modular components that expose well-defined interfaces and can be invoked and combined to create complex business processes. SOA promotes reusability, flexibility, and scalability by enabling services to be developed, deployed, and maintained independently. It facilitates integration and collaboration between disparate systems and applications, allowing organizations to build agile and adaptable IT ecosystems. SOP, or Standard Operating Procedure, refers to a set of step-by-step -step instructions or guidelines that define how specific tasks or processes should be executed within an organization. SOPs are documented procedures that provide consistency, standardization, and clarity in performing routine operations or activities. They outline the necessary actions, roles, responsibilities, and quality standards required to accomplish a particular task or process. SOPs help ensure efficiency, accuracy, and compliance in organizational workflows and promote best practices. SOW, or Statement of Work, is a document that defines the scope, objectives, deliverables, and timeline of a project or engagement between a client and a service provider. It outlines the specific tasks, responsibilities, and requirements that the provider will undertake to fulfill the client's needs. The SOW typically includes project milestones, resource allocation, payment terms, and any other contractual terms and conditions. It serves as a foundation for project planning execution, and evaluation providing a clear understanding of the work to be performed and the expected outcomes. SQL, or Structured Query Language, is a programming language used for managing and manipulating relational databases. It provides a standardized set of commands for creating, modifying, and querying databases and their contents. With SQL, users can define database schemas, create tables, insert, update, and delete data, and retrieve information using queries. SQL is widely used in database management systems and is essential for working with structured data. SSH, or Secure Shell, is a cryptographic network protocol that provides secure and encrypted communication over an unsecured network. It allows secure remote access to and control of network devices or servers. SSH establishes a secure connection between the client and the server, encrypting data transmission and preventing unauthorized access or interception. It's commonly used for secure remote administration, file transfers, and secure command line access to remote systems. SSL, or Secure Sockets Layer, is a cryptographic protocol used to secure communication over the internet. It provides encryption and authentication mechanisms to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity of data transmitted between a web server and a client's browser. 
S-Cell establishes a secure connection by encrypting data during transit, preventing unauthorized access or tampering. SSL has been superseded by the more modern TLS, Transport Layer Security Protocol, but the term SSL is still commonly used to refer to secure connections. SSO, or Single Sign-On, is a mechanism that allows users to authenticate themselves once and gain access to multiple applications or systems without the need to provide credentials repeatedly. With SSO, users can log into a central identity provider once and then can access various resources and services seamlessly. SSO improves user experience, eliminates the need for multiple usernames and passwords, and enhances security by centralizing authentication and authorization processes. TCO, or Total Cost of Ownership, is a financial metric that calculates the total cost associated with owning and operating a technology or asset over its entire life cycle. It considers not only the initial acquisition cost, but also ongoing expenses such as maintenance, support, upgrades, training, and disposal costs. TCO provides a comprehensive view of the overall cost and helps organizations make informed decisions by considering the complete cost picture rather than the, just the upfront investment. TCP-IP, or Transmission Control Protocol over Internet Protocol, is a set of networking protocols that form the foundation of communication on the Internet. TCP provides reliable and ordered delivery of data packets, while IP handles the addressing and routing of those packets across networks. TCP-IP enables devices to communicate and exchange data over the Internet, allowing for the transmission of information between computers, servers, and other network devices. V2P, virtual to physical, refers to the process of migrating a virtual machine or workload from a virtualized environment back to a physical server or infrastructure. It involves converting a virtualized instance which runs on hypervisor or virtualization platform into a physical instance that operates on a physical server. V2P migration may be necessary in certain scenarios such as hardware upgrades, platform changes, or specific application requirements. V2V, or virtual to virtual, refers to the migration or conversion of a virtual machine from one virtualization platform to another. It involves transferring the VM along with its configuration, settings, and data from the source virtualization platform to the target virtualization platform. V2V migration is often performed to take advantage of new features, improve performance, or consolidate virtual infrastructure. VDI, or Virtual Desktop Infrastructure, is a virtualization technology that allows multiple desktop environments to run on a single server or set of servers. It enables the delivery of virtual desktops to end users who can access their individual desktop environments remotely using thin clients or other devices. VDI centralizes desktop management, improves flexibility and scalability, and enhances security by isolating desktop environments within the virtual infrastructure. VLAN, otherwise known as VLAN, or Virtual Virtual Local Area Network is a network technology that enables the segmentation and isolation of a physical network drive into multiple virtual networks. It allows network administrators to logically divide a single LAN or local area network into separate broadcast domains, each with its own set of devices and traffic. VLANs provide enhanced security, improved network performance, and better management by isolating network traffic and controlling communication between different network segments. VM, or Virtual Machine, is a software emulation of a physical computer system. It enables the execution of multiple operating systems or instances on a single physical machine known as the host. Each VM runs as an isolated environment with its own virtual hardware, operating system, and applications. VMs provide flexibility, resource optimization, and easy deployment of virtualized workloads in server virtualization environments. VPN, or Virtual Private Network, is a secure encrypted network connection that allows users to access and transmit data over a public network such as the internet as if they were connected to a private network. VPNs establish a secure tunnel between the user's device and a VPN server, encrypting data traffic and ensuring privacy and confidentiality. VPNs are commonly used for remote access, securing connections between geographically distributed networks, and bypassing regional restrictions. WAN, or Wide Area Network, is a network that spans a large geographical area and connects multiple local area networks, LANs, or other networks together. It enables the exchange of data and communication between different sites or locations, often over long distances. WANs utilize various technologies such as leased lines, satellite links, or internet connections to connect and interconnect to networks across wide geographic regions. XML, or Extensible Markup Language, is a markup language used for storing and transmitting structured data. It provides a set of rules for encoding documents in a format that's both human-readable and machine-readable. XML allows users to define their own tags and document structure, making it flexible, 
and extensible. It's widely used for data exchange and storage, representing structured information in a standardized format that can be processed by different applications and platforms. So now we're on to a section that I like to call the extra information section, which is not covered in the CompTIA exam objectives. This is something that I've done myself just to make sure that you have all the information you need because there are going to be questions on this additional information. First subject, cloud service provider versus managed service provider. So CSP stands for cloud service provider, while MSP stands for managed service provider. While both types of providers offer services related to technology and IT infrastructure, there are some key differences between CSPs and MSPs. So let's explore them. First, we have the scope of services. So cloud service providers primarily offer cloud computing services and infrastructure on a subscription basis. They provide scalable resources such as virtual machines, storage, networking, and software applications delivered over the internet, whereas managed service providers offer a broader range of IT services, including infrastructure management, system administration, network monitoring, security services, and technical support. They can manage both on-premises and cloud-based infrastructure, providing ongoing maintenance and support. Next objective is focus. So cloud service providers focus on delivering cloud-based services and platforms. They specialize in providing scalable and flexible computing resources, enabling customers to deploy and run their applications in the cloud, whereas managed service providers focus on managing and maintaining IT infrastructure, regardless of whether it's on-premises or in the cloud. They ensure their smooth operation of systems, networks, and applications, and often provide proactive monitoring, security, and support services onto ownership and responsibility. So cloud service providers own and manage the underlying cloud infrastructure, including servers, storage, networking, and data centers. They're responsible for ensuring the availability, performance, and security of the cloud infrastructure. Whereas managed service providers typically work with a customer's existing infrastructure, whether it's on-premises or in the cloud. They take responsibility for managing and maintaining the customer's infrastructure, ensuring it's in optimal performance and security. Now we have the service delivery model where cloud service providers offer their services on a self-service basis, allowing customers to provision and manage resources independently. They typically provide a web-based interface or API for customers to interact with and manage their cloud resources, where managed service providers deliver their services through ongoing contracts or service level agreements, SLAs. They provide dedicated support teams and experts who actively manage and monitor the customer's infrastructure, often with a more hands-on approach. Next, I want to touch on customer engagement. So cloud service providers engage with a broad customer base, ranging from individual developers and small businesses to large enterprises. They focus on providing scalable and cost-effective cloud services to a wide range of customers. Whereas managed service providers often work closely with specific customers, developing long-term relationships and providing tailored services to meet their specific IT needs. They emphasize personalized support and customization for their customers. Overall, while cloud service providers primarily focus on providing cloud computing resources and platforms, managed service providers offer a wider variety of managed services, including infrastructure management, support, and monitoring. Organizations may choose to work with cloud service providers for their cloud-specific needs or engage managed service providers for comprehensive management of their IT infrastructure, whether on-premises or in the cloud. Now we're going to touch on something called vendor agnosticism. So cloud principles encourage organizations to adopt a vendor agnostic approach, selecting cloud services and technologies that offer interoperability and portability across different cloud platforms. This principle supports flexibility and avoids vendor lock-in, allowing organizations to leverage multiple cloud providers or migrate between them if needed. The next bonus section is vendor relations. In cloud adoptions, establishing strong vendor relations is crucial for ensuring the success and effectiveness of the cloud services. Here are some important business aspects of vendor relations in cloud adoptions. Vendor selection. Choosing the right cloud service provider is a critical decision. Organizations should evaluate vendors based on their expertise, reputation, service offerings, pricing models, security measures, compliance standards, and ability to meet specific business requirements. A thorough vendor selection process helps ensure compatibility and alignment with the organization's goals. Service level agreements define the performance metrics, service guarantees, and responsibilities of both the organization and the vendor. It's essential to negotiate and establish service level agreements that clearly outline the agreed upon service levels, availability, support response times, data security, data ownership, and any penalties for service disruptions. Robust service level agreements provide clarity and accountability between the organization and the vendor. 
Developing comprehensive contractual agreements is vital to protect the interests of both parties. Contracts should cover key aspects such as data ownership, data privacy, intellectual property rights, service termination, dispute resolution, liability, and indemnification. A well-drafted contract ensures legal compliance and establishes a mutually beneficial relationship. Effective communication channels and responsive vendor support are essential for addressing issues, resolving technical challenges, and ensuring smooth operations. Timely and reliable support services, including help desk support, ticketing systems, and escalation procedures, play a significant role in maintaining a positive vendor relationship. Proactive vendor management involves regular performance assessments, monitoring compliance with SLAs, evaluating vendor responsiveness, and ensuring contractual obligations are met. It also involves staying updated on vendor developments, new service offerings, and emerging technologies to leverage the latest innovations and maintain a competitive edge. Engaging in collaborative discussions and feedback sessions with vendors can provide valuable insights into improving service delivery and optimizing cloud usage. Collaborative partnerships foster innovation, enable knowledge sharing, and facilitate the customization of services to better align with business requirements. Implementing vendor governance frameworks helps organizations maintain oversight and control over their cloud services. This involves establishing governance committees, conducting periodic audits, monitoring vendor performance, and ensuring compliance with security and regulatory requirements. Vendor governance helps mitigate risks, enforce policies, and ensure transparencies in vendor relationships. As cloud technologies evolve, contract renewals provide an opportunity to reassess service requirements, negotiate pricing, and explore new features or offerings from vendors. Organizations should proactively engage in contract renewal discussions to optimize costs, negotiate favorable terms, and align services with evolving business needs. Having a vendor continuity plan in place is essential to mitigate the risks associated with vendor disruptions or service interruptions. This plan outlines backup strategies, contingency plans, and alternative vendors that can be leveraged if the need arises. Effective management of vendor relations and cloud adoptions ensures that organizations receive optimal value, reliable services, and support from their chosen cloud service providers. It promotes collaboration, innovation, and the ability to adapt to changing business needs. The next additional section is DevOps in the cloud. So DevOps, short for development and operations, is a set of practices that combines software development and IT operations to enable the rapid and reliable delivery of software applications. In cloud environments, DevOps principles and practices are often applied to streamline and automate the deployment, scaling, and management of cloud-based applications and infrastructure. Here's an explanation of DevOps in cloud environments. DevOps encourages close collaboration and effective communication between development teams and operation teams. In cloud environments, this collaboration becomes crucial as developers and operations personnel work together to deploy, configure, and manage cloud resources. CICD is a key aspect of DevOps in cloud environments. It involves automating the process of integrating code changes, running automated tests, and deploying applications to the cloud environment. CICD pipelines ensure that new features, bug fixes, and updates are quickly and reliably delivered to the cloud infrastructure. DevOps emphasizes the use of infrastructure as code, where infrastructure resources such as virtual machines, storage, and networking components are defined and managed through code. In cloud environments, tools like Terraform or AWS CloudFormation are often used to provision and manage cloud infrastructure resources in a consistent and repeatable manner. Automation plays a vital role in DevOps practices in cloud environments. Tasks such as provisioning and configuring cloud resources, deploying applications, and managing infrastructure are automated to reduce manual effort, minimize errors, and improve efficiency. Orchestration tools like Kubernetes or AWS Elastic Beanstalk are commonly used to automate the deployment and scaling of cloud-based applications. Cloud environments provide the ability to scale resources dynamically based on demand. DevOps practices leverage this scalability and elasticity by automating the process of scaling up or down resources as needed. This ensures that applications running in the cloud can handle varying workloads efficiently and cost effectively. DevOps in cloud environments emphasizes robust monitoring and logging practices. Monitoring tools are used to collect and analyze data on application performance, resource utilization, and user experience. Logs provide valuable insights into the behavior of applications and help in troubleshooting issues. Monitoring and logging help ensure the availability, performance, and reliability of applications running in the cloud. DevOps teams in cloud environments prioritize security, 
and compliance. They implement security best practices such as managing access controls, encrypting data, and monitoring for security threats. Compliance requirements specific to the industry or region are also addressed, ensuring that applications and data in the cloud meet the necessary regulatory standards. DevOps practices enable rapid iteration and feedback loops. By automating the build, test, and deployment processes, developers can quickly release new features and updates to the cloud environment. Feedback from users and stakeholders is incorporated into subsequent iterations, allowing for continuous improvement of the application. In summary, DevOps in cloud environments combines development and operation practices to enable faster, more reliable, and scalable software delivery. It leverages automation, infrastructure as code, continuous integration and delivery, and collaboration to streamline the deployment and management of applications in the cloud. The goal is to achieve efficient and agile development processes, reduce time to market, and enhance the overall quality and performance of cloud-based applications. Guess what? You made it to the end. Congratulations, good job. I know that was a lot to take in and some subjects were redundant at times, but this will give you a good fundamental understanding of cloud services for the business world. Of course, if you're going to specialize it and climb the corporate ladder, there's still a lot more to learn, but this is still solid foundational knowledge that you can use. I wish you the best of luck in your career and I will see you in the next video.